Welcome into another episode of yeah. That's Fucked Up. As always, we got a guest here. Southern California native, actor, rapper, songwriter, comedian. Okay. Best known for his work in Nickelodeon's All That. A hey, comedian is a little questionable. There. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and respect them. All it's the comedians. There. Hey, it's I'm, fun, there. I'm funny as hell, though. I can do it, but it's a, I guess I'm not a stand up comedian. Pomona's own. Oh, God, shit. Leon Lee Boy Frierson in the house. Damn That's right. right. This guy up there. Damn right. right. All right. If anybody grew up. In the 90s, early 2000s, watching Nickelodeon, watching the slime shows, watching everything. You probably saw this guy right here. The youngest cast member on the show. All that. Basically, Saturday Night Live for kids. Welcome Everybody to watched that shit. Yeah. Hell yeah. I was watching well, that shit before I got on there. That's how everybody I got on. watched Nickelodeon. <laughs> for yeah, sure. Yeah. So, growing up in Southern California, right? Absolutely, yes. Was the dream always to be an actor for you? That was... That but for me, deal. probably more for my parents. Your parents. It was kind of that thing where they seen, <laughs> they seen I was, you know, rambunctious. Well, you know, Wikipedia says you've been writing raps since you was real young, like seven, yeah, that's six, not acting. doing I guess thing, you, you know, you were, a lot you of were trying actors, to do something. Right? You were trying to do something out there as a kid. Yeah, it's you not saw exactly your future. acting. You know, I was definitely into music at like six, seven years old. I had a little McDonald's rap, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, about... Like on a commercial? No, no, no. This is actually how I got my, my agent was uh, I had wrote a rap about McDonald's and they really liked it. But even before that, I was, you know, writing about being on the playground. My dad put me on to Too Short and shit that I shouldn't have been listening to. But, <laughs> yeah, I definitely uh, saw the influences was like Easy and Too Short at 7 and I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> but yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. that thought back to the 90s when I was a kid and I was like, oh yeah, I mean, I was listening to Tupac at like 10. Yeah, you know? yeah that was so, same, same for me. It's yeah. different than Too Short though. Too short yeah, is like the worst. Is deep. But yeah. too short's right after <laughs> too short Tupac. You go Tupac, nah. too short, easy, and you gotta go through the whole list. You get there. You get there. You by, eventually get there, by like but there are some thirteen. I don't, I don't know. Tupac has like a freaky tales though. Yeah, like, yeah freaky like, tales. No, but but you lead up into it. I told you like my music history with Michael Jackson. Then I had that weird Garth Brooks country phase because you know I'm from Nebraska. Straight to Tupac. Okay. And okay. it was over. <laughs> then it was over. For me, it was more like Vanilla Ice, Immature, then Too Short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> vanilla Ice. Back to your roots. <laughs> he was like, oh, you like rap, huh? We're going to put you home. Look, look. That's what the hell happened. So, yeah, how did you get discovered? That's how you got discovered. You said you wrote a McDonald's rap. You were in a couple commercials, I think, when you were a kid, it said. Yeah, so I was... Um, Look, so born in Orange County, moved down to San Diego. My my pops was in the military, so we had kind of were moving around. Um, and some, you, you know, them commercials that say, "Hey, your kid want to be famous? Mm -hmm. right. Your kid want to come down and audition?" That yeah, was like in the mall and shit. Yeah, it, it, but it was on the radio. It was Sweet. on the radio. They're like, "Come down to a, a acting workshop," and then they try to charge you like three thousand. We, we got charged. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got charged, but luckily enough, you know, I was talented to actually book an agent. Ninety percent. 95% of those kids that pay for headshots and acting classes don't actually book the agent. So what got me the agent was my McDonald's rap. It was like filet of fish, french fries, some bullshit. Some shit. I don't, yeah. I don't even eat filet of Bring fish. Bring it back, man. You sell that shit right to McDonald's right now. They need a new rap. They need a new yeah. rap. What, what? Pusha T didn't do good enough with the boom, boom, boom. Is, is, he, is he on a McDonald's rap? Uh, he made up. Um, I he stole it. your shit? Yeah, man. You were you know on first? Saying? And they say I look like the clips, too. I used to get that back in the day. <laughs> but um nah so so yeah I was lucky enough to book an agent from San Diego. I started running up to auditions in LA three, four times a week. Got a couple commercials. Uh a Santa sing along was like actually my first job. Were they national commercials? Because I heard you get paid a lot for that. Oh, I, I I had a couple national commercials that paid way better than a Nickelodeon, but we'll talk about that. Um <laughs> Specifically, American Express commercial. I did one with Seinfeld. I think I did like an Oscar Mayer commercial. Little stuff. That's dope. Yeah. Were your parents like Macaulay Culkin in you back in the day? And just like <laughs> Wait, stealing, your, stealing your funds and shit? Or were like... How'd it go? No, no, that part. You had a good family that like put the shit away. Okay. I had a good family. No, so because Macaulay the Culkin was like the one who got the law passed, no, or some shit. Or they who, protect who, the kids now. They get a special account. Yeah, but his ass was back in like '95. 
Oh, okay. No, no, no. And I, the Coogan Law, I believe, was did exist then. There is ninety five. There is a, a child actor. His last name is Coogan. I, I wish I knew his name right now. I want to say Michael Coogan or Andrew Oh, it's not Coogan. Macaulay Coogan. No, it's not. I thought he it was sounds like Coogan. Like, like, not Coogan McCullen. No, no, not him. But there is a Coogan actor that did kind of establish that law. So yeah, I did get a certain amount put away. But of the funds that I was getting from Nickelodeon, like a little thirty percent wasn't like you know hitting like that. Yeah. I pretty much bought a car, went to the one year of college, and that was it. But um, no, my, in general, my mom, she always worked. She actually, you know, when we moved up to L.A., she transferred her job up here. So she never really stopped. We hired um, someone on set to be with me. So I had like a, a nanny that was always there. Uh, my mom and dad had split at that time. But everyone around me still worked. So I have a work mm-hmm. ethic that was just kind of coming from my parents. Um, but I think they re- it wasn't they didn't put me in the business to you know, set them up. It wasn't because yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. It was That's because I, they saw some talent in me. I was the kid. I was, you know, doing the talent shows in the living room, uh, you know, always going crazy for the family. It was like, we don't do that new dance. I was that kid. And, and so then, um, it, it kind of just blossomed into an acting career. And then all that came around. All and that was like get, my, my first get? majors, you know, booking, especially when it comes to TV. Uh, my um, question mm-hmm. is, do you still do the Jim Carrey, uh, Mike, <laughs> no, Mike no. Tyson impression? Because <laughs> no. I said that's how you got the job with the Jim hey, Carrey, you, Mike Tyson yeah, you impression. Did a you did a little research. <laughs> yeah, um, I loved uh, Lemon Color and Fire Marshal Bill specifically. <laughs> that laugh that he used to do was my thing. So uh, I did I did Jim Carrey. I did a Mike Tyson. You still um, got the Mike Tyson? Or no, you let it go? no, hell no. Do that. <laughs> and this is when you were auditioning for Nickelodeon, this all is, that. This was in the room, yeah. So they asked us to prepare a couple characters. Okay. We also had some sides, so we did do a scene. But for the most part, they wanted to just put us, uh, wanted to see us up there, see what the hell we had really from nothing. And, uh, you know, I did a grandma, Mike Tyson, and uh, Jim Carrey. And uh, okay. and so, you know, I, I guess I did. I did all right. You, know? you got the job. Yeah, I got the job. You know <laughs> what youngest saying? kid on the set? Yeah. At the time, said, you were the, the youngest, youngest kid, kid on. How was, how was that, being the youngest, yeah, so youngest I'm, kid out there? I'm, I'm like three months younger than Amanda Bynes. And, you know, I think she was the youngest when she had first came on. And then there's also Katrina Johnson, who was the youngest when she came on. So I was the youngest during my tenure. I was yeah. 10 years old when I started to about 12 or 13. So I did three seasons. And, uh, you know, I was uh, I was a kid, bro. I was a goofball. Me and Amanda was running around crazy, like definitely was just causing havoc on the set for sure. Uh, you know, Lori Beth Denberg, she was like the elder statesman. She hated us, you know what I'm saying? Now, this is kind of a joke, but she was definitely annoyed bias and i can only imagine like 21 year old around some 10 year olds going crazy <laughs> but um you know i was just a lot of times starstruck by the musical guests that we had you know we have a long list of amazing musical guests you know with white club jean beyonce and yeah Jeff so Lee's many Child. people were on the show uh, i saw that I was ice cube uh there's, there's tons of names deborah cox i could go on and on besides that you, you were on the 97 right yeah about 97 to 2000 yeah were you in the episode with Chris Farley? Was Chris Farley on the show? Chris I Farley was on the I show. I see an edit, or I see a credit to Chris Farley, and I'm like, Chris Farley on the show is crazy. I think that was the season before mine. Right yeah. before you? Oh, yeah, right before shit. mine. And I was a fan of Chris, just Damn. slapstick, crazy comedy. Yeah. I love Chris Farley back then. I would have loved to uh, be able like, to be in the scene with him. I wonder what he did. I should have looked it up. What'd he do? I think he was in the bathtub next to Keenan. They did Pierre S. Cargo. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, they did that, um, which is, you know, they're just speaking in French, and then they translate it to English. And it was always some crazy shit like, I love pickles in my back. You know what I'm saying? It's cool if you <laughs> and then you're like, your trans- back? Yeah. yeah, see? Well, I just made that shit up. No, I, was, I was like, what the fuck? But if you look at it, it was a lot of hot dogs and ducks and rear talk, you know, my belly button well, type shit. Who like. was your, who was the favorite, like, celebrity guest that you got to work with or person that came on or somebody who influenced you or helped you maybe or was just the, the most fun to work with, I guess? Because yeah. a lot of people came on, like, Britney Spears was on. Where all the musical guests, did the musical guests do Skits. Usually they would do a well, small skit. Or? It was very similar to Saturday Night Live. Yeah. They wouldn't do the whole show the way they do on Saturday Night Live, but they would probably be in one skit and maybe like, um, you know, kind of introduce something like. So it, it it was very similar. Cause bro, you had wait a minute, he you know, did. musical wait a minute. guests from LL Cool J, Tribe mm-hmm. Called Quest, Nas, Aaliyah, Erica Badu, Mace, Buster Rhymes, Usher, Missy, Destiny's Child, wow. Ice Cube, Shaq was on that motherfucker. Outcast. Britney Spears. Britney, was it 
young he, Britney, was she like a child or was this older Britney fine as hell? Her sister was on the show, no? The, yeah, in later seasons, Jamie ended up being on the show. Uh, Britney Spears was there. Actually, her and NSYNC were there the same week and they shut shit down. Yeah, like, I it saw was that. crazy. Back to um, back. I want to say this was like around 99, 2000. So when did she come out? 90. I don't know. I'm Eight? not sure. But she probably was, you know, maybe 18, 19. Her and Justin were definitely dating at the time. It was oh, okay. like during that, you know, the whole jean era, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. the whole jean shit that they wore. So who was the best on then? Who was the best guest? <sighs> Musically or just in general? general. Actor wise first, and then we'll talk about music. You know what? I would say, you know, one of the best people, my favorite to kind of go back and forth with and uh, meet was Wyclef Jean. And I mentioned him first because, um, one, I was just a, a fan of his music at the time, but he actually took a big interest in me because I was doing CJ and Cloudy Nights that week. This um, In this particular scene, it was kind of like Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5. So I was up front singing. I had a big afro, and he was acting like he wanted to sign you, boy. I was yeah. like, okay. Yeah, yeah, I rock a white club. But, um, but, you know, he was also producing Destiny's Child at the time, and I just seen him as a music mogul. And we had a, a quick little, you know, chat relationship. It was really dope. And I would also throw Shaq right in there. He really came on as a musical guest, but anytime, if you've ever met Shaq, and I met he him a couple fun. times, yeah. he's yeah, just he's one of the dopest time. people to yeah. meet. Yeah. He's one of the dopest people to meet. I have a picture that I still, you know, post up every, you know, every once in a while. Every time it's his birthday, shout out to Shaq. Yeah. Um, I last seen him at the Kobe Memorial, and uh, he's just a great dude, represents L.A. well. Some, and um, you know what? I, I'm gonna go ahead and put it out here that one of the worst guests. Oh, yeah. that's what we got here. Yeah, worst this is, that's guests. Fucked there up. There we go. The and worst. Was, hey, this was fucked up. Okay. Kobe Bryant, man. Rest in peace to my guy. <laughs> he was one of the worst guests. <laughs> Damn, Kobe. He didn't want to interact. He didn't want to sign my jersey, bro. Uh, I'm a Laker uh, fan. Man. I'm a Laker fan. Chasing down Kobe. You know, he was, I want to say it was his second season. He, he, he appeared he in. He wasn't even a star. He was in. Exactly. He still he had the star shit, yeah. bro. Like, hey, he, 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 he was coming off the bench. He, 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 he was doing that time. No, nah, fuck that. He was coming off the bench. He was second behind. He went to prom with Brandy. He went to prom with Brandy. Fuck that. And he he was mad because I would have told him, get that shit braided, bro. Do something with that. Pick it out correctly. No, I'm playing. But no, and obviously. Kobe, we we love and cherish him. This is L.A. But I did have, you know, I was salty about Kobe. You know what I'm saying? I had to like, I couldn't like praise him the way I should have, like wanted to when he passed away. Because I had to keep it real, like you know what? I've been hating on Kobe for a while. Yeah. Like, he never um, signed that jersey, I'm motherfucker. Sorry. No, but he did. No, <laughs> oh, he, he did. did get the jersey. I had a producer that ended up shipping it to him, and he signed it. He sent it back, so I did end up getting the jersey signed. So I can't be completely so mad. Talk shit. But I ain't get no picture. <laughs> I didn't get no picture. I didn't get the personal experience. And, you know, I was That's spoiled. Deep. You know what I'm saying? I'm used to, yeah. you know. He get slimed? No, nah, he didn't get slimed. He didn't get slimed. He was like, fuck, don't put nah, that slime on me. Does that affect your love for the Lakers? I'm not sure if you're a Lakers fan. Yeah, I'm a Lakers, Lakers fan. Yeah, yeah man. I, was, I, just, I hopped on the Clippers for a couple years, you know? <laughs> Damn. Knuckleheads. <laughs> yeah. He was like, fuck Kobe. <laughs> it was later on, but, like, you know, I had a little gripe with him because every, like, when they started winning championships, going crazy with him and Shaq. You know, everybody was jumping on the bandwagon in high school. It was just like, man, I've been a Lakers fan since birth. My dad basically put me onto the Lakers when I was a, a, a little kid. But um, so I, I switched over to the Clippers for a couple years. You know, I was rocking with Q Rich. Uh, you know, what's my guy? Darius Miles. Yeah, we're Clippers yeah. fans over here. McGetty. We yeah. We're Clippers fans over I'm here. McGetty. Olu, you know, Olu 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 Clippers. Olu 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 they, had a, they had a squad. But no, I came back to, you know, I came back to life because I was dead. I was dead in the water with the Clips. But no, so like, I ended up getting it, though. So we Musical guest would be Wyclef then? Be no, 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 no. I was Musically, who was, fi- who was like... Or who gave the best performance, I guess, on the show? I would say... Because everybody did a song, right? We be clubbing. <laughs> Ice Cube. Ice Cube. Ice Cube was crazy. Like, he just came man. in like... Yeah, and like, like one hearing that show. on the All That Nickelodeon <laughs> set. And then like one of the producer's kids, like Brian Robbins. I don't know if it was his actual... Like, I don't... Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure, pretty sure it was his kid. But we was hella tight. But he was up there crip walking. He's like a little white boy. You know what I'm saying? We was up there. My homegirl. We, I invited a homegirl out there. She got on stage. She had all the kids hop on stage. So it was, you know, and it's we be clubbing. It was like we was really clubbing at the all that set. But um, as far as like my favorite, someone I just really looked up to that was crazy was Lauren Hill. 
Um, you know, I'm just a big fan of her work. She actually never came on set. <laughs> she was at the Hollywood Bowl, and they, like, kind of, feel, you know, uh, put the footage in. But in general, just having her as part of the show, just as part of that long list of names, that oh, roster. she was never actually there? No, she was on the 100th episode, and she didn't actually come to the set. But her performance was at the Hollywood Bowl, and it was dedicated to all that. But still, she was a legend at the time. You know, she that was during her Grammy tenure. You know what I'm saying? So it was, uh, you know, and she was probably a little bougie. So she wasn't going <laughs> to come up to the set. No, no. How many? Hell, Acts were there for the hunter show. It was like that was like a I want like two or three of them, no, or something. Was like I can't was. remember. I can't remember. Um, I, I, I just I think it was. I want to say it was her. You might be thinking of the tenth anniversary. And I, don't know, I saw one where there was like. I think maybe her and like Buster Rhymes, maybe or somebody. It else. might have been a couple. Know. It might have been a couple. I can't think of it. But at there the were so many people. Yeah, but Buster Rhymes. Well, Buster Rhymes was definitely came, dope. It was like if you're going through a circuit in the '90s, you had to go through Nickelodeon, which is crazy. It's that just is, crazy that's because why. musically yeah. it makes sense though. Yeah, you have Buster Rhymes, and I mean, and the, and the the show intro is created by or sang by TLC. Yeah, yeah. so they started off wow. high already. TLC did like two. Of the first episodes, they did the first mm-hmm. one and the third one, I think. So, so they started like, off with a bang, and then it was just, a, you know, it's amazing. And it's probably one of the best things that I really love about being part of a show like that is just the cultural impact. You have all those people that infuse the hip-hop and R&B culture with kids. And so, you know, definitely happy to be a part now, of that. So we always ask on most people, and since you're into music and you do music and you've seen a lot of guests, who's your five favorite rappers of all time? Oh, okay. we always have that question here. No, that's cool. That's you cool. Know, let's see you what know? you got going on. I got here. a biased list too. You're a West uh, Coast guy. Let's yeah, see how it yeah. goes. So I'm a already Are you West Coast throw... bias. In your... Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna throw E40 in my list. Oh, talk about it. Said, E40. That, talk he about could, it. He could be number one. I ain't gonna Damn. do. It. I ain't gonna do the rest of the game <laughs> like that. E40. Um, I also throw Snoop in my top five. Okay. And it's not because of bars or anything. I mean, Snoop do have some bars. He might get off, especially in the freestyle. Don't do not under. Estimate Snoop in a freestyle, but um, just you know his aura. I just he might be one of the most recognizable rappers of all time. So most people, recognizable recognize voice people of, of all, all time. time. Yeah, just right. voice. Period. So that's that's the bias. Um, but you know, to me, they are truly top five. I could I mean, I could throw like a Mac Dre in there. I ain't gonna do. I ain't gonna go that far. Ooh, you but, could but, throw whoever you want in your list. This is your list. He, Don't he, worry about the people. This is your list. Right. No, you, he's in Oakland heavy right now. Yeah, yeah. That is true. I do like a lot of Bay Area rap. If you guys listen to my my debut album, Make Music Slap Again. You know, slap is a Bay term, and um, a lot of my influence does come from the Bay. I love some slaps. <laughs> um, but Jay Z definitely. I you know if someone was asking me i'm like he's to me the just the best he's just the best rapper all around when you go to what he's done off the court so we have this argument court. a lot and me and my friend alejandro over here say that kanye is better than jay-z we just that think musically and catalog wise he, he thinks jay-z is better but right now kanye's album's out streaming all of jay-z's music combined so. <laughs> Sure. I listen to the album and I'm I'm trying to understand why it <laughs> it's not made for you. It's not made for you. Hey, hey, I just bought my bitch a bitch. Yeah, that's it. Go hard. Um, no, nah, you know what? I, I could throw Kanye. I could throw Kanye. Don't let them sway you. Don't, don't, don't let them, let them sway you. Well, who are you talking? You got, you, got, you got two more. E40. I got Jay Z. E40. I got Snoop. Snoop. Let me. Um, I'm gonna put Kanye in there. Okay. Ooh. I'm gonna okay. put Kanye in there once again, not because of bars. To me, bars don't mean is not everything. Bars is not everything. But um, you know what he's done musically is just crazy, and he continues to do it. Uh, one more, one more. Let's see what I got here, man. This is difficult. Um, it ain't Nas. I'll tell you that. Uh, it ain't him. <laughs> or like uh, Alejandro likes to call him. Nice. 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 <laughs> um, no Tupac, no Biggie, no Ice Cube, Cube, no shit. I will. Um, so no, let's round it out with Pop. Disrespecting Tupac. No, let's know. round it out with Pop. Okay. Let's okay. round it out with Pop. Um, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I'm so worried about you for a second. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all I was going to say he wasn't even top 50, and I wanted to just throw oh, him out no, of no, no, throw no, him no. out I the building. I wouldn't say that. You <laughs> yeah. know what I'm saying? You know what it is, though? Just just to be completely honest, like, 
you know, the age that I grew up, I didn't, I didn't get to hear all Pac's music. Like he has just so much music. So you We're would have the to, same go, age. you would have to go back and research it. Six baby. Yeah, you're right. But you heard all of his songs. Everyone. See, and I, I'm from a town of 395 people in Nebraska. See, I was, I would, I, I wouldn't, I'm not gonna sit here and cap and be like, I know all of his shit, but I just, uh, you know, I respect. Um, his artistry I respect his artistry uh, He makes amazing songs Very similar to Kanye To me uh, As far as them both Being Gemini's Both being outspoken uh, Not giving a fuck Who, who I cares think lately is There's a lot of disrespect On the internet When people talk about Tupac Every comment section I see is like Tupac was a fucking actor And he went to art school And he's not a gangster And Hey, he when was, did everyone start talking like this? Why is everybody talking <laughs> I mean, about Pac like this? I mean, there might, might be right? some truth to that yeah. too. Okay, so you go to art school, but you can't grow up and want to shoot people too? No, <laughs> no, but he did Not though. He did school. shoot people. <laughs> yeah. See? No, he did. He did. Yeah. And, now, and was, that's true. And it was cops too. Well, they yeah. were undercover. He didn't yes, know. Yeah, he, yeah. Didn't know. Yeah. he was yeah. out there yeah. putting it. He allegedly didn't know. Hey, that's kind of wild. He was. He was tripping. You gonna put your whole career on the line for two dudes that's beating up some random guy? Like, you know, I, I respect shit like that. He put know? his whole life on the line for some dude that was beating up some guy. That's why he got killed. For beating up that dude or whatever that fight or who knows, you know, you know, all the conspiracies, but you yeah. know. And the rape allegations is completely false too. Absolutely. Why yeah, would that, he ever that rape anyone? That's crazy. That he went down, try they try to take him you down. You think for that's that? true? No, I don't think it's You're true. You're laughing. No, 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 not really. They say the girl, he, I guess he had sex with her or something happened in his bedroom. And when he walked out, his friends raped her or something like that. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Something he, like he that. But he, but he had nothing to do with it. Nah, he nah. was sleeping. <laughs> 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 I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't finish the job. Fellas. You got it. You got it. Nah, nah. Don't do Pac like that. But nah, Pac, yeah. you know, he's, he's just legendary. So... There's certain certain people just like a snoop that just get to me. They get put up there. Um, now, if you want to go into bars, that's just totally different. But I don't, you know, bars is what it is now. What do you got on bars? I, I like I like battle rap because I believe them boys have What's a lot. A battle rapper. Who's your top battle rappers then? Shout them out. Let people know. Let people know who to listen to. Uh, I, you know, I like a Sue Surf, the Wave. You know what I'm saying? Somebody like that. Um, I also like Daylight. You know, these guys have incredible. Uh, Daylight has incredible bars that you can't even follow. Um, but I would just, I would, I'll start stop right there because I haven't listened to battle rap probably for the last couple years. Um, so speaking of another thing, what, what's up with Don't Get Clowned or oh, Club shit. Circus shit? <laughs> Shit. You talking about your music? You was doing some shit in the Inland Empire. Said that caught some fire. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know what it was. I was taking down Tommy. Know. I was taking down Tommy the Clown. What's a couple that? of them, you know what I'm saying? They used to what have ice clowns mean? out there. Um, so you know there was a huge uh, clown crump scene out here in California. <laughs> you guys, I'm sure, are somewhat aware of it, clown? right? Like insane clown, clown posse. No, like dancing, clowning around. Actually, this is the beginning of twerking, fella. Like we was out there. Unfortunately, you know, we was out there moving our ass. Um, <laughs> also, Chris you walking. were twerking. Yeah. yeah oh yeah. my Sounds god. Terrible. No. Hilton, <laughs> Hilton. But, now, but this was on ladies. All like we was on their ass. We was taking them oh, down. Okay, okay. You know, milk them. It was like like low key, low budget stripper moves and well, stuff. We was getting the party active, you know what I'm saying? Like you know when freaking was freaking, but yeah. we had to, you know, we had to do a little question. Said some this question shit caught shit. fire in the Inland Empire. Uh, what happened in the Inland Empire? Why was it going crazy over there? <laughs> well, you know what? It, it got so crazy, specifically at my school, you know, because we had. We, we started taking over, like, our rallies, and they would just let us perform. And it got so well-liked by our school. They gave us our own period at school. Like, you guys go to dance class. <laughs> but it was just us yeah. just making up routines and ill-tone, crit-walking, twerking, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Pot-locking. Hey, it's going to be great. Yeah. We would do all, they was like, look, y'all so, y'all could just go do y'all thing for a whole period, and we got credit for it. So, Damn. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, we was dancing outside of Ontario Mills and, like, had full-on battles in, in front of, like, you know, the most popular areas in the Inland Empire. But it came from L.A., keep it clear. Like, Don't Get Clown was um, actually my L.A. Uh, version so I had a whole crew out here with um I don't know if you guys know Man he did he did the song with Fifty Cent buzzing 
me and him were both in Don't Get Clowned um, and, and a couple other people that, that have done some things in the industry. Uh, but he's most notable. Um, and I had a version that I took out to the IE called Club Circus. That was the club because we was literally a dance club at school that turned into a period at school. And we was just taking over uh, the entire Pomona Unified School District. We was battling anybody in the district. And nobody wanted to smoke with me. My footwork was impeccable. <laughs> I was just going to say that. Like, it was nasty. I was doing, you know, I, I can't do none of that shit now. I, I ruptured my patellar tendon, so don't ask me. <laughs> Dancing? Uh, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> Playing basketball. <laughs> I just, yeah, I ain't stretch. Playing basketball, but. Um, so, yeah, yeah I don't got no moves. Basketball always takes some motherfucker yeah, down. That every, when I did that shit, everyone was like, basketball? Yeah, I was like, yeah. What's yeah, happening yeah basketball. Ruptured my shit. Shit, but yeah, that no, was af- that was after the the Nickelodeon shit, though, right? That's like yeah. So that was kind of me like saying fuck the industry. I kind of quit and like really didn't care too too much to acting after I did in like three or four years. And I'm like, look, I was like getting paid to do parties and we would go to do uh, performances and you know wherever we we was getting a little money here and there. And so I just was like, look, I'm gonna do this. I was creating some of the music that we were dancing for. Also, I always was writing raps, always produced and recorded my own shit. So I was just like at and, by the time I was 14, I'm like, I don't really need to. Now, were you writing for all the different um, companies or just you had that McDonald's one and then you let it nah, go? I didn't do, no, I didn't I never wrote for no company. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing my own shit. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, you know, my, my r- first rap group was The Circuit. Uh, it was three of us, myself, Marvel the Great, VIB, Easy, um, and those fellas. And one of them went to God. Shout out to my guy. Uh, well, he was B. They said you broke up with these cats. Yeah, now you started son, your own solo shit. Sun Wo, uh, Sun Wo, he, he's gone on and, um, you know, d- doing gospel rap still to this day. But he, now he's the one broke up the group. I didn't break <laughs> He fucked up the whole group. Like, so one of our biggest performances, we performed in front of Lenny S at the Key Club, and he was very interested in us. It's actually still on youtube and he was like hey call rocka rockfella we gonna get you on blah 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 and bro i think i was calling on west coast time <laughs> <laughs> i should have been calling at like six in the morning to to at nine. <laughs> i'm hitting at nine and you know it's like 12 lunch and i'm hitting up for every day for like a month straight never got in touch with him um but you know he was real interested and us and um and along with some others we were really dope you know I, i'm not a part of no bush i ain't gonna be in no bullshit group i'll just let you know right now i'm a talented young man you know what i'm saying <laughs> still young out here so if i was part of it, it was some fire um and we definitely have some fire it's just you know we was probably getting a little bit too on one of the dudes had to get the fuck up out of there he was like y'all going crazy <laughs> damn <laughs> so, okay so we was too turned up getting and crazy another, another one we we uh opened up for j cole back in the day we had him at the house damn. Was, he was okay. smoking with us and chilling you know what i'm saying he was rocking with us um this was at lmu and so uh you also open for like the game um uh, E40 N-O-R-E, Locks Soldier Boy It says yeah, The game E40 You did that N-O-R-E, solo though right Soldier, I opened up for Soldier Boy In the game solo um, But uh, also in conjunction With one of the Dudes Where from at? the group uh, What was like The biggest venue You, you opened up for That was popping Well the crazy. game Was out in San Diego In the Gaslight District um, This when he was big Yeah Okay Yeah this was Well probably like 2000 I want to say 14 or something, 12, 13, right. somewhere, around, somewhere around there between 12 and 14. I, my years is all fucked up because we was on. <laughs> we was on a little bit. Um, and then Soldier Boy might have been like 2015, 16 or something like that. Um, but we, we consistently rock like the Key Club and all, all the shit that was right there in North Hollywood. We was all the way, all the way. Can you up, find your music street. now on Hell Spotify? Yeah, yeah, yeah. not okay. on Spotify. You can find our shit on like one. You can find it from my Instagram at Lee Boy TV. If you go to my little drop down links, I got the two of the circuit albums on there. I got my shit on there. Uh, Make music slap again is on um, on Spotify and on Apple Music. It's on all the DSPs, so you can definitely find my personal album. And uh, it is stuff that I made probably from around 2016 2018-ish but I, I released it in 2022 uh, just because, too long ago no nah, no nah, yeah. not too long 
One of them still slap. Go, uh, you know, uh, well, it all slaps. It all slaps. <laughs> but you can tell, you can tell that some of it is, you know, a little bit dated. But I didn't want to let that period go past without me at least releasing something uh, officially on that can everyone can stream and listen to. Yeah. Um. So I would definitely, you know, encourage everyone to go check it out. Make music slap again. Some definitely some cancelable uh, material on there. So don't hold me to it. All right. It was when before I had kids. That's what actually made me stop. I'm like, I can't be doing this shit <laughs> with two little kids, you know, popping out. So I had to, you know, do my corporate thing. But you know, like like I said, in 2022, I just decided, hey, let me go ahead and just let this out for the people in case they want to stream your boy. Going back to the Nickelodeon days, you worked with Keenan and Kel. Nick Keenan was on the show. How was that? Because Keenan. Turned into like Saturday night. He left us all, man. Yeah. Fucking legend. <laughs> he was like the most episodes ever on Saturday Night Live. Wow. He did all the episodes on this shit. He like basically skit comedy fucking royalty. So he's how holding that, SNL that, alive right now. Yeah. How was that working with him? How's that coming up? Or like seeing him develop into what he developed into? Maybe if you saw that even. I don't know, but. You know, I think guys. I think on set we all saw it for Kel more. I don't know if you guys, you know, familiar yeah, Kel with had them. more dynamic it's in Kel like Big Burger, Burger, yeah. And Kel, all the ladies loved Kel. And he was getting all the spotlight, and he was, um, you know, he had a great personality on and off the set. Where Keenan was just more reserved, very professional, always on time, doing his shit. And that just is a testament to hey, it's not always you know your talent; it's also your work ethic and things like that. So it's definitely a test to a testament to his um, his dedication to to the. Craft. Um, and Keenan and Kel, you know, they were a big influence for me, even taking the audition so seriously. Like, I actually have a journal entry from when I was, I want to say second grade, that I just, I wanted to be on all that. I wanted to be on there after seeing them just because, um, you know, it was just two black kids acting crazy. They got to kick it with Aaliyah and Usher and TLC. And they, <laughs> you know, were acting, you know, they were portraying these characters mavis and clavis was hilarious and um obviously good burger and all that stuff so they were probably my favorite celebrities you know going into this audition and the reason why i, I think i just took it so seriously and tried so hard so working with them was really literally a dream come true like it was um you know, and that's something that I would think definitely thank Nickelodeon for the opportunity to let me see their greatness in person and really, um, you know, allow me to grow up around someone like that that became so successful. Whatever happened to <clears throat> Kel? Kel, he's still he's still in the game. Uh, he got a um, he's doing music as well. I th he's doing some stuff with MTV. Um, so he's still he's still around doing movies. Some of them independent. Um, but they just good did Good Burger, Burger too, out, right? They just did Good Burger too. It just came out uh, a couple months back on Paramount Plus, which is actually a shit out. Yeah, yeah the number one, out. the best original streaming Paramount film. Is it good or is it like Joe Dirt Two? Because Joe Dirt <laughs> Two was like the worst fucking movie ever made. I would say it was I love Joe Dirt. <laughs> what? Joe Dirt Two? No, I'm talking about Good Burger. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. But Joe Joe Dirt, I see Joe Dirt Two. That I see shit, Joe Dirt One. The same joke lines and like it's weird. It's, it's weird. Are you a big fan of Joe Dirt? Hell yeah, Joe Hell Dirt was yeah. fucking yeah. hilarious. Up, Joe, Bur Joe Dirt, Dirt is one of the funniest fucking movies. <laughs> Fuck no, no, no. <laughs> like it's okay. It's, that movie is so like goddamn funny. Was that David Spade, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that shit was funny though. That, that shit, shit was so funny. fucking funny. <laughs> I do like shit like that. I ain't gonna lie. He's got a fused in yeah. bullet yeah. to his head. Yeah, he's he's that shit was fire. But no, Good Burger too. I I think it, it is good for what it was. I, it's good for what it is. It's definitely a word the uh, successor to Good Burger 1 for sure like they follow a lot of the same storylines as far as you know the the story path and uh, they brought it into the two, 2020 four or the 2020s right with um they have like some ai components that are taking over the burger industry and shit like that so it, it has a good story oh, well nice written here. um you know I'm, i watched it with my kids is it and for they, kids is yeah, for kids i watched it with the kids and they thought it was hilarious so yeah, I, I think that's seven, a good meter. i will eight year old now eight yeah. year old and a three year old so are we almost in the same i got eight and five so okay yeah they like burgers kid friendly it's kid friendly. I thought it was cool. I, I watched it twice, so it was good enough for me to give it a you know a rewind. So and Nick Cannon was on like how many episodes? Thirty episodes or something like that. Where yeah, you were he came with on. him, or he was after you, or so yeah. What, what was dope eras, about Nick but. Cannon? He was actually the hype man for the audience for mm. my first season, and then he just did so well. And you know he was known. You guys, I'm sure you guys may have heard his story that he was hanging out with a bunch of comedians. He was actually at um, you know doing stand up that entire time. Very clicked in with the uh, comedian community and they just got him on the show like 
they they were just like we need this guy and he ended up walking literally from like uh from hyping up the crowd to walking on set the next season not really sure how it happened i know a lot of us was like damn he just gonna steal all our roles just straight from the audience <laughs> uh, people was probably hella jealous and mad like because we was always fighting for airtime and shit like more skits how many skits i'm gonna be written in this week because uh you know that was always a concern so to get someone on like nick cannon who was an immense talent I'm sure it was jarring for a lot of people, but he was hella cool to me. Like he, he had a Range Rover at like 17. He let me ride in that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Only West Coast nigga I knew with Tim's. He definitely showed me some culture. I'm like, who, who rocks Tim boots in the 90s? But that was always Nick Cannon, great dude. How competitive was it? Like now that you mentioned, like you know, like the airtime, and you know how, like between the actors. I think you know. And I, I want to say this is probably the same on most sets, a lot of sets, but it was specifically competitive because it was a, um, you know, a sketch comedy show. So some you could literally be written in one sketch for this week and be like, damn, you know, like they ain't really fucking with me this week, you know, like um, and then especially for, you know, when it comes, you know, I was a, obviously one of the three Uh, male black character or cast members and so there there was kind of like shit that they had to spread between me uh keenan and kel and then you add on nick cannon so like we we're all kind of fighting for the same shit although you know i was younger than them but the three of them were definitely like fighting for the same opportunities and i would say in in general people was there was a lot of hate mad behind the scenes like uh you know shit talking Uh, for me, I, I was just 10 and happy to be around. I was just more, you know, concerned with meeting the musical guests and trying to, uh, you know, build with them and, you know, getting on Tekken. Like, they had Tekken on the set. I'm chilling with that, being in the green room, kicking it with Keenan and Kel. I was in a couple, like, uh, classroom sets. I was cool. Like, and, you know, they was always trying to throw me in, like, a, you know, like a, a dress or uh, some tights. Anyway, I'm cool. <laughs> you can leave me out of that shit anyway. Like, you know, let me just do my thing, be myself. I was always happy to be, a, like, kind of minimal and then uh but i did have my own signature character leroy of leroy and fuzz so uh you know i did maybe five or six of those per season so i i was already feeling the love with that and um you know i was just happy to have my own signature did character it seem like, like the that. people i don't know if the writers were on set but it did it seem like the people who had better relationship with the writers got more roles I, absolutely i think that was always a factor um And, and not in a bad way. It's just maybe they were just more from where pitching their ideas, pitching characters. They'd be like, look, I thought of four characters, and I want to put one of them on the show, and they would work with the, the writers in that way. I don't think I was that okay. ambitious that way. Maybe because I was just 10, you know what I'm saying? Right. I'm just happy right. to be there. I had a lot of schoolwork I had to take care of, and, you know, I had to go home. I, was, I wasn't living in L.A., so I was, like, traveling back to the IE, and uh, I had a lot of shit going on. Also doing plays at Amazing Grace Conservatory. Shout out to Winnie Rick. Kel Robinson, all them, they kind of grew me up in the industry. But um, so I had a lot of shit going on, whereas, you know, like a Christy or Christy Knowings or like a, even a Keenan and Kel, a Danny Tamarelli, uh, Lori Beth Denberg, some of these people, they would just have characters and probably pitch them to the writers and they would write them in and you would see people that were really conversing with the writers get some shit done, including Amanda Bond. She was really tight with Dan Schneider, um, with, mm. you know. And, um, you know, she ended, up Amanda, the, she ended up getting the Amanda show and, you know, the rest yeah. of history. So. Speaking of her, um, she was discovered, they said, I think I saw when I was watching those documentaries, which we're going to talk about in a second. Like, let me stop uh, laughing. <laughs> she was discovered at, like, workshops they used to have at the Laugh Factory for kids. So I didn't even know they had that yeah, shit. Yeah, I didn't either. I did they, some, yeah. They, you had some? Wait a minute. So they was like... They, at the Laugh Factory for kids, like comedy acts. Yeah, she was she was a comedy act. Yeah, she was definitely oh, wow. like the height of kids entertainment, Not, like the Nickelodeon days, like from there. Because I ain't never heard of no I, shit like one that. One time like, I went to the Chateau of Comedy, and you know, because I was trying to do like you know some whatever, <laughs> and they were all fucking kids. Wait a minute, please tell me you didn't do any stand up. Stand up? I, I was trying to. They said and that they were like, 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 like,
need that footage. <laughs> no, no, because it, it said it was the open mic night, but then there were a bunch of kids. I'm like, this fucking kid's taking away my shine. God, <laughs> you did some at the Laugh Factory. Well, I, did, so. I think I did the gong show at the Laugh, Laugh Factory. So I went up there and did like a little set. I didn't get gonged. I don't know if you guys remember that shit. That shit's old as hell. But, um, but you could go up there and do anything. So I did that in the Laugh Factory as a kid. And I messed around with stand-up a little bit. But Amanda, she was a beast, though. I don't know if you've seen some of the footage in the yeah. doc. And, uh, yeah, that's how she got discovered was just basically doing sets, you know. Um, Stand up at, like, eight. Yeah, she was, like, nine. That's awesome. Eight, yeah, maybe eight, yeah. Because I think she got on the show, she was, like, nine, ten. So she was doing that at eight. And she was, like, you know, and, you know, to her credit, she was incredible on the show as well. Like, she did Ask Ashley, which was basically, like, a three-minute monologue, just her talking to the camera, reading letters, and just going off, blowing up about the stupid shit that they would ask her. Uh, you know, with me and my single, my signature character, I had a puppet that I would play off, so it was a little bit different. We would go back and forth, and there were some things involved, some physical comedy, but she was just her, a camera, going at it for three, four minutes. So what she did on, on stage, she took right to the show and... She's she's un, she's almost unmatched as a nine year old. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's she crazy. Was crazy. The footage I saw, like, I never, I only heard, like, I never watched that much Nickelodeon. To be honest with you, mm -hmm. or none of that shit, or whatever. And when I saw her doing her shit on this documentary, I was watching. I was like, God damn, she's like super good and confident, and like crazy delivery, crazy timing, crazy like everything. When she's like eight, ten. Wow. And then they give her her own show and all that kind of shit. But you were you were close to her age, right? Like, yeah. So, you, so we were basically were like two of the youngest on the show. Yeah. So we were like best friends on the show, man. Like we were three months apart. Uh, in fact, her her birthday's coming up, and um, you know she was the way she was. Shout out Amanda Bynes. You're always welcome Amanda on the Bynes. That's Fucked Up Hell podcast. Yeah. Come on in here. Check got, us out. Yeah. She got a lot of shit that she could talk about. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Exactly. I can't speak for her. But no, like, we were best friends. Like We visited each other's houses. She actually came out to see some of my plays. And, um, you know, the way she was on stage was kind of like her personality in person. She's very bubbly, very personable. She gets right to it. She's hella cool, um, which is just a huge, huge, hugely different to who she is now. I don't know if you guys seen the videos. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's not a laughing matter, really, but she's just a completely different person, someone that you don't really recognize when you grew up with them. And, uh, you know, definitely I've been that's, trying to get in contact with her because that's the homegirl, right? So let's talk about on why maybe she is these ways. She because you definitely put us on to some documentary that is dropping tonight. I love it. What's it called? Quiet on set. Quiet on set. Some of the craziest shit I ever heard. I you know none of this shit was going down at Nickelodeon. First time I ever heard of this shit. Dan Schneider, sick ass jokes, crazy kid shit going on. What's some wild shit you saw on set? Yeah, so first you were in off, this documentary. We gotta let them know because they told us to make sure we shout them out properly because yeah. they gave shout us, them out. You know they let us see the doc. Um, quiet on set. The Dark Side of Kids TV mm. airing Sunday and Monday. So, you guys, it's already out. Go stream that right <laughs> and now. That shit's HBO crazy. Max. I already watched the first two episodes. And I'm like, how are you going to leave me like this? I got to go see the other two. Yeah, it's crazy. What streaming platform is it on? It's on HBO Max. HBO produced Max. by Investigation Discovery. Um, and so, and, you know, they're great people behind the scenes. What was your question again? Um, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you get that The question is, like, well. some just fucked up... Is Dan Schneider going to prison? Because this is crazy. Like, <laughs> is this like an Epstein thing? Like, what's happening? Because as soon as this drops, like, I didn't know about this shit. I didn't know about this guy. So Dan Schneider apparently, right, Dan created Sh most of the kids shows that we know on Nickelodeon. Okay. He's known, yeah, he's known as like one of the most prolific kids show writers, creators, uh, created uh, iCarly, Victorious. Um, he didn't create all that, but he was there from the beginning and, and was writing from the beginning. Like um, Keenan Kill. I'm not sure about Keenan right? Kill. I know Amanda yeah. Show. I don't think Keenan Kill. Amanda Drake and Josh. Okay. Drake and Josh. Oh, yeah, Drake absolutely. and Josh. That's the one. That's the one. And then uh, I think I want to say Danger Force and one of the newer ones that got rid of him recently, but he had came back just a couple years ago in like two, 2016, 2015, did a show. Yeah. 
Yeah, your and, ass and, better go away right now, Dan Snyder. Because <laughs> this shit is crazy. So I will say, as far as him like going to jail, he hasn't been like charged, I don't believe. I don't think he's has any like formal charges or ever been convicted of anything. So we're just gonna put that as out. Everything is alleged with him, right? Brian Peck, who is, is like a buddy that he brought from sets and uh, so, kept around yeah, as so an acting again, coach, we is convicted. Saw the first is convicted. Two episodes, which leaves me kind of hanging when it got to all the we- crazy shit. So it wasn't and Dan's so not right now, yeah, yeah. Dan's kind of just like a sick weirdo in his head that's like, but he's the head of all these fucking jokes. Like, you guys are basically doing cum jokes. You got dicks and balls on your shoulders. Damn, and like, yeah. you know <laughs> wait, what I mean? Wait, hold on. This balls, sounds bro. fucking balls, terrible. Bro. Come on. What <laughs> kind of show is this? So, it was in the thing. Yeah, yeah. You I saw said, it? I said penis and testicles. You know, I got to keep it, you know. This you is that's <laughs> fucked up, man. You got to <laughs> keep it with the real terms, the medical terms. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I ain't fucking with no dick and balls. Come on, bro. <laughs> well, you got some penis and testicles <laughs> on your fucking shoulders in some yeah, space. Next. What's the significance of that, bro? With it kids? was feet jokes. It was no, like foot face feet jokes. Fetish shit. Not, yeah, not just feet yeah, jokes. Yeah, like yeah, kids like, like praising feet. They're touching, or like you tickle my feet, and you're like, <laughs> and then like goddamn glory hole and pickles. Dude, so passing pickles through a glory hole. So let me start out. Let me start off though with dance. Like you, you wanted to bring them up. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so I would say around 2020. And, uh, you know, I had by this time, I was like completely out of the industry. I never gave a damn. Uh, is I didn't have anything against Nickelodeon, but I did want to kind of be an advocate for child stars and shit that we went through because it's kind of fucked up how they left us out here destitute. But oh, it's du- fucked up. But during that time, though, I was doing my research and just looking at Nickelodeon and I started seeing uh, Ariana Grande with a foot in her mouth, you know mm. what I'm saying? Squeezing potatoes and trying to squeeze the juice out Charlie of potatoes. Juice out of a potato. Ariana Grande had a foot. In her mouth, her own foot. Oh, her own foot. Okay, her own foot in the mouth. But still, still, it's like all these feet things together. Like it's a bunch of shit. Water on herself and giggling and uh, making words on a fucking. Ben. Who the fuck is writing all these shows? This Dan dude. Snyder. Dan Snyder. <laughs> he wrote all these shows. Well, he was the, well, he the had lead writer. He was the head writer yeah. of the writer's room. And, uh, you know, in the you'll see in the documentary, they talk about him having, like, pornography up on his on his screen during, in the writing room and kind of... Always asking for massage. Dan Snyder is in the same sense that you think that white people aren't funny. He said that uh, women are not funny. But he had two women writers on the show. And he challenged them to think of a funny uh, female writer, right? Yeah, and then yeah, he, had, he had one of them like reenact some sodomy, like well, in she was telling the a story about like how she could connect in it, it could, to a high school story. And she was telling about her high school, and he was like, "That would be funny if you did that and acted like you were being sodomized." And then just like didn't let it go. The documentary said, and like the lady had to do it, just like bent over the table in front of everybody in the writing room. And just like talking like she's getting fucked in the ass, which we know that sodomy has been clearly you stated. It's Gen- both. Yeah, sodomy both. is apparently anal uh, and oral. Anal and oral, but oh. I didn't anal know that. Anal or anal or. I did not or. know that. Oh, I'll be sodomizing in all play. Wait, cut that shit exactly. <laughs> no, Only one way, only one way, not the back way. Yeah, but like crazy shit on set. And you said in the thing that like Amanda had been so what? So I didn't we, I didn't get past the second episode obviously because we didn't get it yet because I got to tune in to it. Mm-hmm. But it'll, it'll be dropping on what, Monday. You guys can already watch. Are it. you uh, saying DMX. that Amanda was always missing during like school time <laughs> and shit like, like that? The way they or how they that chopped out. it or whatever you I say. Ain't gonna say it was out of you made it say yeah. it, you, know, <laughs> you were looking around for Amanda and she wasn't anywhere to be found. You know, and I just look at The question is, was Dan able to be found? And look, I never really was in Dan's office or kicking it with Dan. And maybe he just didn't think I was that funny and we didn't connect. Or maybe my parents were just like, you don't go kick it with old white dudes and chill. Like, that wasn't really my thing. But, you know, I maybe just thought of Amanda. It just seemed like she was always gone. So, like, the way they put it in the doc, I ain't going to say it was, like, out of context. But if they put that shit in there, right? (laughs) Was she hanging out with Dan a lot? You know, I did her. Her and Dan have a great relationship? Her and Dan had a great relationship. And so she did hang out with Dan quite a bit. You know, 
I, I could vividly remember him, her like, you know, giving him massages or he would be like, you know, hugging her for the back. I'm, I'm saying, you know, like it's totally relatable. She was like kind of in between his legs, sitting on his lap and shit like that. Like some, maybe an uncle might do it. Like, no, you're close no, 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 yeah, okay. Maybe, yeah, you know, you're right. I don't, I don't grow up on my, I don't grow up on my niece like that. But you know, you you have seen uncles do shit like that, right? And it's like yeah, the maybe uncle. if it's a family member, it could be permissible. But for a stranger or a, pro, a professional colleague, it's just totally unacceptable. To me, it'd be unacceptable if, if that was my daughter. I'd be like. Get your ass over. Here. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Let's go. get your ass but, over. Here. What but is so this? Amanda's family the doc that you could, okay, that you on. couldn't bring. Like parents weren't allowed on the set. That's no, I wouldn't say that. Which it wasn't like because that's how they made it sound on the dock. Like you had to pass your kid off to a fucking basically pickle boy and fucking walk you back to set. No, I would I wouldn't say that, but I do. I would say that the parents that were more involved, they did seem to like there might have been repercussions with your child's airtime and like your Damn. relationship. Like a lot of people have said that they're like you know. If I stood up or I said anything like they didn't wasn't really feeling this kid, the USC like Brian Hearn, he's in he's in the dock. He basically said he just got cut out the whole show. And I don't want to speak for Angelique Bates, but she has shared some stuff online about you know her um, about her family situation and how it ended to ended up being her demise on the show as well. And so you know with me. I always had a stage sitter. It was just a sweet old lady named Geraldine that was always there. Geraldine, shout, yeah, out, shout Geraldine. out to Geraldine. You know, she was always making sure I was coming back to the room. You know, eat some food, and she was, you know, she was quiet and discreet about it. So she probably was doing the right thing. Um, but in general, like I always just thought it was, you know, Amanda. She was just getting preferential treatment because she was the star, right? And so maybe she didn't have to do school as much as us, or she was just not, you know, hanging out where I would be. And so I'd be like, moment, where the hell was Amanda at? Like, in the moment, it didn't seem weird, right? It didn't seem weird. It just seemed like maybe they called her in for. A, a, you don't think sitting in between a producer is him weird? What was going on? If that was my daughter, I would have lost my mind. Yeah, of course. So I take it her family weren't her really there. In the documentary, it says her dad was like. Super tight with Dan Snyder, and that's yeah, how her she dad got was her there. Shit. Her dad was there and was friends with Dan, and literally to the very end, where Dan tried to like steal her and emancipate her, and he she was ended up living at his house for yeah. it. Then I mean, after the, so sometime during the show, she wanted to be emancipated away from her parents, and, Dan and she to help her. went to live with Dan. Yeah, she was like man, about 16, 17 look. around that time. Yeah, and this was after our. This was after us being on the show. You know, Dan and that's asked, confirmed that she lived with him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I believe that part is in the doc. I believe yeah, that. Yeah, so if it's not, that, please excuse me if I misspoke. She's that's what the documentary, documentary said. said. But the documentary does that's say that, and I believe said. they did. They did that that I don't think they said that exactly, but they said her parents were mad about the situation. She that ran away from home them. and ended up at Dan's house. That's basically yeah. what they say in the doc. And so he comforted her, he brought her in and was working behind the scenes to get her emancipated so that way they could continue to do, and this sounds bad, do more adult acting, not not adult like as in yeah. P-Star shit, but, um, you know, more grown up roles. And she had a whole um, career trajectory that she had in her head that she was crafting with Dan. And um, so you know, Dan was acting as if he were her. Agent or future but look, agent, but no, but I want to know how when she Nickelodeon. was in Nickelodeon. She had a skit called Penelope Taint. <laughs> Penelope Taint. Yeah. And okay. he said, in "Don't the tell docket, nobody what it is. Yeah, don't tell nobody. What everybody taint knows is. what a taint is. Yeah, you know what a taint is. Yeah. You know what a taint is. Everybody yeah. knows what a taint is. So in the documentary, it said he got away with it by saying it was short for tainted." Or some weird shit like that. And Nickelodeon is just like, okay, that sounds fucking normal. Penelope oh. Tate every day on Nickelodeon just talking so, like, I'm so Penelope did, Tate. So did Nickelodeon <laughs> But what's worse, point, that or Pickle Boy? But go ahead, no, go ahead. Yeah, we'll get into Pickle Boy. Yeah. And then Nickelodeon admit that maybe they fell asleep at the wheel. So they put out a statement recently saying that, you know, they were unaware of some of the things that were going on. 
um, and that they basically wish the best for everyone. And a lot of people think it was Chad GBT. I don't know. You know, y'all got to come up and follow up that statement. But Dan <laughs> Schneider on the other end was like, look, I sent you guys every skit, every costume, all the content. You guys approved it. He said on two coasts because they had an office out here in L.A. and in New York. So uh, apparently Nickelodeon saw everything, approved everything as it was coming out. So, um, you know, whether he was lying to get by, but it's like, if you don't know what a taint is and you don't know what a dude holding a uh, tray of pickles is and you don't know what a, uh, you know, a fake cum shot looks like, it's just like, I don't know. And But I will say, though, as a kid, I wasn't thinking about that shit. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't think, you're not thinking like that as a 10 or 11 year old, but as if I was writing that as an adult and putting kids through this, I would absolutely, absolutely be in the frame of my life. Yeah, we got over on the ass. Like, come on, man. It's like, you in the adult mindset, there's no way you're 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 looking so past. So when did you did you never out. started noticing no like weirdo shit on set, or you was like walking down the hall and was like, what the fuck, and or like you ain't never seen no, no shit, or was like, eh, this ain't right, or like no, uh, no. So because what I would say is, you see a lot of like the you, you would see a lot of the staff members like fraternizing with kids and the younger people and they'd be like why is so and so going over his house to go kick it after set and why is they going to the parking lot I was just a little bit too young to partake in any of this stuff right how old are most of the kids I know you were the youngest at 10 how old were most of the kids most of the kids were between like 16 to and they were up to 21 but they were starting at 16 right so like Lori Beth maybe started at 16 by the time I was there she was 21 but they like a lot of them were well, in that age that's yeah. crazy fucking age anyways you know, kids no, that's crazy. The, that's the moment. That's the time. Shit. Yeah, right. They want to kick it, chill, probably smoke some yeah. weed, drink, give them a little drink, kick it, and then. So here's you know my what question saying? to you: Those older kids on set, they didn't ever say shit about this young girl. Or like Keenan and Kill were pretty old on set. They nah, were not, I don't think anybody was. They were not writing shit like because all the jokes, all the sick jokes, were like written by Snyder or like <clears throat> who was writing all the sick jokes? Because oh, there was damn, a group, I, wanted, I got a couple of homies that are writers that is cool, there was but a group I don't know what of they were like writing. writers, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it wasn't just Dan Snyder like writing. Nah, these nah, jokes. there's definitely like, a writer team. Some and of them every I'm, picture I see, like mm -hmm. Kale, like old as fuck, right? Next to everybody, like everybody was older to notice these jokes. What I, sits. what I noticed in the documentary is how many people were complicit between the behavior of some adults and also the pay wage, because they do mention that about uh, two female writers that were paid, like if there were the one male writer. Wage, which is crazy. Yeah, and they split a, uh, split a salary. How do you how do you split a salary with somebody? That's <laughs> <so> crazy. <laughs> like, yeah, hey, look, man. We're going to pay both of y'all one. Yeah. Uh, I get one. I get a check and she get a check. How are we splitting this? That's what do you crazy. mean? You just cut my shit in half. Um, <laughs> but no, it, is um you know as far as what, what both of you guys are saying and yeah would like Keenan or Kel stand up and be like nah I don't want to do that you know I would see them kind of like maybe want to modify the script because there were versions so we would get a, a version on Monday by the time Friday it would be a little modified maybe Keenan and Kel says something but I never seen them like challenge any of the writers like at the table reads and be like this is this is gross like nobody ever said this was disgusting or lewd or this is not for kids i never heard no shit like that now they may say i don't feel like being in tights again like can you put me in something else different like you know what i'm saying like we, we a little bit sick of the the dresses you know what i'm saying he didn't play like miss piddling and he he was i know i know kenny was tired of all that shit what? So, Okay, no, go on. So I would say that a lot of it was, to me, i seen a lot of it was about costumes, and I don't think anybody would stand up and just challenge Dan because they knew the power that he had with the yeah. show. Um, and I will say, though, for two of my seasons, though, he had part ways. They they kind of were sick of his, his behavior on set, and so he was, he was gone for two of my seasons. A lot of the stuff that we see in the documentaries when he came back, had his own shows, and this was off him trying to create something for Amanda. It didn't work, but they were like, no, nah, come back. We'll give you your own shows, and that's when he had the Drake and Josh, the Victorious, and the Amanda show. All the crazy shit happened really when he came back. It, a lot of it was not on all that other than a, a hostile work environment is what happened when I was there. It wasn't really the sexual so, shit. Was there any producers that actually got convicted of child molestation, rape, or anything like that? Did anything, like, during that time period, did anything actually happen? So, yeah, in, in the documentary, and you guys, once again, go watch it, the whole thing on HBO Max, they 
they have um, they talk about Brian Peck, who was actually convicted of molesting a child star that was on the show. He was on the Amanda show. This is uh, Josh no, Drake. Bell. Bell. <laughs> Drake Bell, yeah. Sorry, I didn't watch uh, Drake and Josh. But it was it was Drake Bell, who is, uh, he's a huge star. I think he has like 4 million followers on Instagram. Kids love him. He ended up getting his own show off the Amanda show. Um, he was molested, raped by Brian Peck, a.k.a. Pickle Boy, mm. who was throwing pickles everywhere on set. <laughs> Not during my time. Not during my time, thank God, because... I don't, I don't know what would have happened with my family and doing seeing shit like that. That's kind of that's kind of strange. That that's kind is of strange. Wild. But he was convicted, and like they talk about it in the doc, like they were wondering who it was that had been molested. So they came out and was like, okay, Brian Peck, who was a speech coach there, a dialogue coach, is not going to be part of the show. And they didn't know why or who he had molested or anything like that. That part wasn't. Um, you know, brought to light until this documentary. So that's what's so crazy about this documentary is that, you know, there was rumors about Drake Bell and what had happened, but he actually sits down in the same chair that I was in and tells, we're going to see, he's going to tell the story. We only seen episode one and two. And episode and two, it's like it was a clip sitting down yeah. right at the end. It's him sitting down and it just cuts out on me. Now, have you heard the news about Drake Bell and the lawsuit he faced because he was messaging an underage girl? Do you think it's rooted with what happened with Brian Pegg? Damn, man. There, there, are, there are rumors also that that's why he went to Mexico he for Mexico a little right bit. Now, yeah. And he goes for by Drake Campana. Campana, am I bad? That's Bell in Spanish. Because in Mexico, a lot of people watch Drake and Josh. Like, he's mm-hmm. one like very popular. In the life. I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico. Drake and Josh, Amanda Vines show. I used to watch that, too. Okay. Yeah, but so, I mean, yeah, he got some similar allegations, and he will put it out there that he was never convicted um, and that he never served any jail time or anything like that. I think he pled out to something of what reckless endangerment of a minor or something like that. But Did he have a lawsuit against Nickelodeon and Peck? I, I don't think so. I don't know. I'm not wow. sure. But I believe all that it will probably come down the pike now because this is the, like, with this documentary is the first time that he's ever announced that he was the person that was abused. So I believe it, it could be coming down, you know, down the pike. I, I don't know. But it's just unfortunate, the cycle, right? That, right. That yeah. now he's he has the, the stigma on his name. And so, you know, I, I would pray for all those involved that they could just get the help they need and just get all that, this child, you know, fucking out your system. Like, get that, do what you got to do. Pray it away. Like, we don't need it. You don't need to do that. You know what I'm saying? And what's the state of Amanda? I know we kind of glossed over it. Mm-hmm. What's going on with her since you were her best friend and you seem like you had the best relationship as a co-star with her? And, you know, and that's a big reason why I wanted to be part of this documentary and also why I started like child star advocacy. Um, You know, I I created a reality show that we're still pitching out there called child star reboot that just, just discusses, you know, what child stars have gone through and how they can prevail past the whole system. But as far as Amanda, she's been recently caught on the streets naked, like Mm. doing uh, very heavily on drugs. It's it's pretty well known. You could tell by her demeanor that she's been battling some stuff. So uh, always definitely prayers out to her, but she's also, you know, canceled a lot of appearances um, and hasn't really been on the straight and narrow from what we can tell from the coverage that we see. So it looks like she's up. Codependent of something. Yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely say so, and you know, hopefully, I don't know the, her state of mind now, and, mm-hmm. but she has admitted to it, and, and you know, has attempted to get clean, and hopefully, she's on the right path. Um, and so, I would just, you know, just hope, hope and the that best. Goes for back to my question: like we always hear about these young actors with all this fame, and you know, a little money being thrown at them, and all this stuff. It seems like. They lose it somewhere in between the lines. I don't know if they got it too early, too fast, or what happens, but you kind of seem, it kind of seems like they go crazy. What do you see that happens with on the set or out, off the set that actually leads to this? Contributes to that. And yeah, and I'll say I have my, before I, you know, I judge anyone, I have my own struggles with alcohol and drugs and stuff. Not to that level. You right. know, I would, I had, luckily I had a, a great support system around me that was like, nigga, this ain't the way, bro. <laughs> 
<laughs> we don't do this type of shit in our family. You're going to find your way out and you're going to get out of here free and clear, hopefully. You know, and I'm still battling mentally. Um, but as far as the things that contribute to just the, the downfall of child stars and I, w- I would say, you know, there's a lot of things. But to me, the biggest thing is is getting all this money, power, fame that's given to you and sometimes undeservedly and it's given to you so easily and, and then you see it snatched away from you so quickly and the things that you do to cope to try to get it back or mm, to try to get back shit. to the top of the mountain when you don't realize you peaked at 12, you might have peaked at 12 and you're on your way down is how do you, how do you navigate the road down? Right. So I was able, you know, I was lucky, like I said, I had a support system that allowed me just to remove myself, be a kid, go out and clown and rap and do shit that people my age do. But if you're constantly on the hamster wheel trying to get to the next show, man, fuck that show, man, because a lot of it is is (laughs) within their power. You can't control whether they want to give it to you or not. You could be the most talented person. I've been the most talented in the room and because of my status or because I was on Nickelodeon or because I didn't fit the framework that they wanted to to uh you know to promote the show I wasn't offered the job or I was offered and it was then it was offered to somebody else like so a lot of things it's not just your talent that that you know you're not you're not in control you're not in control and so a lot of it is just to me trying to get that get that control and once you realize you don't have it these substances and these parties and all these things that that uh, allow you to forget all the bullshit and all the depression and all the sadness of not being at the top of the mountain just leads you astray and so it really just takes a good support system or just a reality check you know that could get you on the like my mom just kicked me out kicked me out and was just like this is the road you're gonna be on and I was just like, damn, this shit is fucked up. Like, let me let me just get my shit together right quick because uh, no one's coming back to save me. You know what right. I'm saying? I think as a man, it's easy. Like, especially as a black man, it's a little bit easier to get that um, that message because it gets drilled into your head from the beginning. But, you know, you one of these white kids out here that just... No, and no offense to you. <laughs> Sorry, man. No, offense, 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 yeah. offense. Yeah, yeah, offense. Yeah, we yeah, all white offense people. to this guy. It's, it's not a white-friendly show. But, <laughs> but I would say, I would just say, you know, they might live a little bit more privileged life where you can do anything and you deserve this, you know? Like, nah, man. That You're not in control of the industry and you can't control who's going to give you, who's going to offer you a job. So it's great because now you can go create your own opportunities in this area, right? We're here and at an independent uh, outlet, you guys got your cameras. You guys can edit this shit right. up and put it out. We couldn't. You can't do that shit back then. It on TV. It's kind of there was no social media. There's no way to promote yourself. So you're really dependent on going into auditions, hoping that someone offers you a job. And even if they do, that you actually make it to the screen because you could do the whole project. And I'm like, ah, oh, that shit was cool, and we could put somebody else in it. So there's just a lot of factors, I think. But mostly, it's just trying to get back to the mountaintop that so drives people crazy. The whole thing of you being on top of the world and then all of a sudden you being released and you're that thirst to try to get back. I believe so, man. That's what it is. Okay. I believe so. And you're going to see that the next wave is going to be the social media stars. You know what I'm saying? Like for us, it was like, I just seen, uh, what was, uh, hide your kids, how's your wife, Andre, Andre Dotson or whatever. Right, right, right. He just got on there and was like, y'all, y'all using my shit. Y'all ain't, they sound just like a child star syndrome. Like, but you know what? I noticed that whole thing about social media stars, especially from the women perspective, they take off more and more clothes because they're trying to get more and more attention. So yeah, I definitely see that. And so with kids and you know, and then there's also another part of it is that, you know, we were on Disney, we're on Nickelodeon, we have this persona. And I know this was definitely part of me and what I went through is like, fuck, I want I want to dodge all that. I want to bypass all that. I'm me. I'm different. I could I could hang out with the kids. I could do this. I'm cool. Because even though like some people may perceive it as, oh, he was on Nickelodeon. That's really cool. Like when you trying to hang out with like you know some th- gu- uh, th- I was gonna say gangsters and thugs at the same time gugs <laughs> and thanksters nah but uh, you trying to hang out with you know the people that's doing some nefarious activity right they ain't fucking with you like that and I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm kicking it with y'all like nah that's Nickelodeon boy that's the Nick kid man go back to Disney and right, shit like right. that and so you want to try to shed that persona and maybe you go off the edge you go a little bit too far um, I would say that definitely hit the the black 
black kids more so. Mm-hmm. And where I see like, you know, some of the white kids, it's just, I, I would say more entitlement or, um, you know, just wanting to get back to the top of the top of the mountain. So there's different factors, definitely, for sure. Well, going back with Brian uh, Peck, mm-hmm. what do you think should be done with him? Because recently in the was news. Was it Brian Peck? That was his name? Yeah, Brian? right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Recently in the news, the the actor from X-Men, the Laser Madsen, uh, mm-hmm. Alan Thicke, right. and Killiam from, um, from SNL wrote a letter. A, you know, a positive letter towards him for his release. Mm-hmm. What should be done with a person that has committed such crimes? Is he still in jail, Brian, P- uh, Brian Peck? I think, or he's just getting out. Okay. Um, I Who mean, the I fuck wrote a letter for him. A bunch of a bunch of Hollywood you people, sick motherfucker, said, "Hey, he was the greatest." And not saying that oh, it was okay what he did, but he was the greatest person ever. He, I had never seen him do no shit like that, it's a and picture. he would never. We had nothing but positive, uh, you know, positive experiences with time. Brian Peck. And I mean, obviously, the dude has a personality. He's kicking it with John Wayne Gacy. You know, you got to be interesting <laughs> to get letters back right. and forth from that guy. But um, as far as what should happen to him, you know, I would just say that I'm not. I don't want to sit here and act like I'm God. I want to judge the guy. Like forty one letters. I ain't writing no fucking for letter. a I'll pedo. Yeah, I ain't. I, 41 letters? And, and what's crazy is so. What the fuck? Some of the people from Boy Meets World, they they had tried to vouch for him and they recently did a Not podcast. Not Topanga. Wait a minute. Topanga. So, Topanga. Not yes. Topanga. Topanga. Topanga yeah. vouched for him. Topanga, you know. And they came back How and apologized. Can you do this? They came back and apologized and some shit. But. Um, God. I mean, Damn. Next yeah, time I see you Topanga, in the Topanga yeah. Mall, I saw Topanga in the Topanga Mall one time. I'm going to trip that bitch next time. You crazy. Yeah, yeah. That cut deep for him. He's a boy in yeah. this world guy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, not Topanga. Yeah, you got to go check out that episode. They kind of walk back. They, um, Damn, you, know, you better walk that shit back, you sickos. But no, I, I mean, definitely, he should definitely have no part in the industry. I mean, at the very least. Um, he comes back straight to fucking, straight to kid shit. I, I would, would say, crazy. yeah, just keep him away. Give him, like, 100 feet from kids. Like, Give him you know what no feet Give from him. anything. Keep his ass behind fucking bars. Keep the feet, sick. the pickles to yourself. But besides bro. him, what about this fucking Jason Handy guy? Yeah, Jason. He's worse, in my opinion. This motherfucker came with, like, 2,000 child porno videos. He had... Little jars of kids like underwear and shit How in his house. How do you even house. get kids jars? I don't know. And like a seven year old kids underwear go- in jars for and shit. Nickelodeon. He was the one that was like PA. He was the, he assistant. was walking them on to their car. He was like the, the kids. To the the head of the kids. <laughs> he was like the head of the like, kids. Anyone can take me back, but this motherfucker. And yeah. <laughs> hey, he was the one taking them back. <laughs> and, and he was from Nebraska. I don't know. That I believe. That I believe. I don't think he was from Nebraska. I don't want to say that. Are you from Nebraska? No, I am. But the lady did say, Jason Handy. I have this written down. Jason Handy. Damn, why why the fuck did she say he was like a dorky white guy from Nebraska? Was he really from Nebraska? (laughs) I never met Handy. I think so. I don't think so. I'm not going to throw Nebraska out like that. That sounds like Nebraska. I think she was just using that as a reference point. I am from Nebraska. Damn, shout out to Nebraska. That's right. But this guy, like, was the dude taking the kids in and, like... He, big, he bro, ended up grooming some young girl bro, from yeah, another set, right? The young she girl just, like, quit acting and shit and all this shit because, like, one day her mom said she, like, slammed her computer down and ran into her room because he sent her, like, a dick pic just jacking off uh, to, like, this little girl. And then fucking... And she was, the like, mom nine was like, years old The or mom was too. like, I don't want to say anything because I don't want my daughter to be kicked off any shows. What, what the fuck? I'll kill a motherfucker right now. I got two daughters. Wait a I'll minute. kill a motherfucker right See, now. See, that's the whole thing. Is is it's almost like it seems like some of the parents aren't yeah, stepping like in when responses. they should step in. They like scared. I didn't like her responses, but back then you like you said it was like if a parent speaks up, you off the next season. Yeah, so, so you're heavily dependent on you know pleasing these these producers and executive producers and writers and creators. The last thing you want to do is you know shake it up 
And you're going to be off. You're going to be off the show. And then not yeah. only that, your name is going to be put across in the industry. They're going to put it out that you're difficult to work with. This is a difficult mom. I've heard that about other moms. The 90s, I imagine moms, moms were right? out there just like getting jobs. What is a stage mom? Out a stage here. mom is somebody <laughs> looking out for their fucking kids. They, they have these bad, uh, you know, they're putting a, a bad mark on stage moms that's trying to st- stick up for their kids because they know the kids can't stick up for themselves. I don't, they, I don't want to be a stage mom. I'm not going to say shit. Fuck Come on, man. Yeah. But that's the that was the culture of not and and I want to just take it's not just Nickelodeon though. It was I want to say this was just the culture of the industry. You didn't want to get in the way. You didn't want to make waves. You didn't want to complain about the outfit. You wanted to just go with the flow, get your shit done, knock it out. The difference was they wasn't doing like you know fake cum shots on ABC and shit. Like you know what I'm saying. The other jobs I had, we wasn't. They wasn't dressed me up in tights and underwear and shit. So well, explain the cum shots because I mean for people who don't know and right, don't right. understand, we didn't really explain that. We, yeah, we didn't really dive into it. So it's just a lot. So there's, it was a consistent thing in a lot of the uh, Nickelodeon scenes, specifically created by Dan Schneider, where there would be a substance that flies at a young woman's face, whether it be some lotion, some goo. Uh, in my case, it was so supposed to be snot, you know, it just hit her right in the face, you know what I'm saying? And I was nose boy at the time, and it just, like I said, looked like penis and testicles all over me. Um, yep. And so... Definitely did. Yeah, Sorry about did, that. yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I didn't even notice it. I was showing my manager, and I, we were looking through old pictures to submit to the doc. He was like, bro, I look like just dick and balls. I'm like... <laughs> And I'm like, damn, it do. And I was like questioning whether I even wanted to put it out there because I don't want to be dick and ball on the shoulder, boy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Keep that shit far away from me. But it's important to, you know, to speak up and, and just, you know, participate and not be scared of. I'm not scared of these motherfuckers because I'm, I'm not, first of all, I don't want to be in the industry and I, I, I want to set up for the next generation to be protected. Like you don't have to succumb to this bullshit to be part of the industry. You have, you can do it yourself nowadays. So you don't have to do that shit. But, um, as far as the cum shots, yeah, it was just a consistent theme of things flying at people's faces. And then some type of weird, like joke, you know what I'm saying? Like either some type of pleasure or some type of grossness. It was like a joke or something too, or they was like just kept hitting these kids where it was like they were almost puking out like fucking come at their mouths basically like just some they white, had them, they had them ingesting like, the sugar uh, just oh yeah real, yeah yeah the sugar real thing. sugar and coffee like at no to no end and then in the scene it was just like they were foaming they were at the mouth so, of just like yeah it was crazy clear gooey substances did you get hit with a cum shot <laughs> hell no I doubt he that shoot her. <laughs> way, hey. that was what I was shooting yeah I was shooting I'm a shooter that was what I was a shooter that was what I was a shooter look you respect respect the shooter right? yeah, respect, respect the go. shooter that's right, right man. But, but you yeah. said in the doc that that was the most uncomfortable thing for you was like being in tights and shit right yeah just the tights See, it wasn't. I, I wasn't even thinking about cum shots or nothing like that. Yeah. I was just. Like, give me I was, these fucking tights. Yeah, but they was putting. I was pillow boy, nose boy, vote boy. Damn, a lot of boys, boys man. That's you know fucked what I'm up. Saying? And now I, I rap as Lee Boy. I don't know if it's just like trauma or yeah, something. Yeah, that's like, trauma. Ingrained. That's trauma. It's ingrained now. <laughs> um, Lee Boy TV on Instagram, but uh, now nah, so yeah, I was constantly in tights, and they they put me in a dress once. And um, that's you know, a hot topic on this on this podcast, whether or not you would sell your soul for the dress. Well, it didn't get me nowhere. Like, I got some next season though. Like, I'm on three season, baby. I ain't getting no show or nothing. But um, damn, I saw. I yeah, was I gonna ask you too because I saw yeah, I saw Keenan in the dress for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. On a couple clips. So Keen, uh, you know, and Keenan was definitely one of his main characters was Miss Piddlin, hilarious. But she's like the lunch lady, and and he titties and ass and he was he was definitely Tyler Perry before Tyler Perry with that so you're like he was killing it too and that was actually one of my favorite characters so um you know in the in the, in the moment you're not really thinking too much of it you think it's funny you know but I was I was uncomfortable with that shit though just because you know innately like I'm just not I just don't want I to feel like 90s early 2000s everybody was 
Nobody said shit about these actors but and like, dresses. It's, like, yeah. dr- like, like it's not the worst Murphy thing, but dressed like, up as his whole family. Comedy. Like, what's common? Everybody but did that. Comedy shit. putting a dress on, like it's funny, no? Yeah, so it's I mean, it funny. Uh, not like, recently, but it used like, to be. Like John Cena in the Oscars. I don't know if you saw him that he walked on stage, yeah, and, like sorry. pretending to be naked, and everybody's saying like, "Oh, that's a, a humiliation ritual." Right. Like he needs that. Like, naked used to be funny. Not anymore. A what? What'd they say it was? Hu- uh, humiliation humiliation ritual. ritual. So he does that, and then they're going to push him higher. a new movie coming out where he's, like, naked in the whole movie. That's the whole thing. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, you know, the lines, I don't think, are always clear. Blurred lines, you know what I'm saying, when it comes to some of this stuff. So you can see it either way. You can see it as funny. It depends to me on who came up with it and who's the one that asked you to do it. And it, can you tell them no? You know that that's always to me a big determining factor. Did you want to do it? Did you? Could you? Sure felt John like you couldn't say no. say no these days. No. Were you able to say no? Yeah. Were you able? Did Hell you, no. Did you ever say no? I had to put some shorts on. Like, hey, can we put some shorts on these tights? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, we can put shorts on over the tights, right? We good, right? Um. And so that's, I mean, that's the way I would just be like, I don't feel comfortable. I would say that shit, but did I outright would just say no? I, I would I would say no. Nah. I would say no. Nah. I, I never really said no. But I was also, at 10 to 12, being on the show, it, I think it is a little bit intimidating when you're working with all adults. Yeah. You don't really feel the power to say no. I could definitely see that. I'm not going to just, yeah, I'm, I, it, it, just, it would be out of place. To me, especially like when my upbringing is just, you know, having respect for adults and just kind of, you know, doing what you have to do. I didn't see it as like, oh, I got to do this to get a check. It wasn't quite like that. Like I felt so pressured, but it was just like, you know, I'm a kid on this set working with adults. I just do kind of what I'm told. And then if, you know, if a parent was there and they would it would it would be mostly up to the parents, I would say, to kind of step in. So the parents never reviewed your script? Or that wasn't even an option. Or they already just said, hey, you're going to be in this scene, that scene, this scene. And they told you that. They never, ever spoke to the, the kid's parents or the guardian that may have been there. No, nah, it definitely wasn't like a clearance with the parents type thing. Nah, it was oh. just like you you get the script, you go through it. The parents ain't going to see it till about Thursday when you're actually rehearsing it in front of everyone. And then you're already filming it on Friday. So there's a huge barrier to be able to like, let's cancel all this shit and refilm it. By, uh, by tomorrow it's kind of like impossible you know what i'm saying like we already didn't work on it we already didn't clear the script it's it's basically a go the la- only power you really had is can we change this costume a little bit because you could just throw on something right so there was you know some wiggle room there which i did exercise as much as possible and then same thing i i definitely seen keenan and kill exercising that shit like hey we need to we need to switch this up a little bit because it was just tights and dresses was just a thing like uh nick cannon he was in a dress. He had um, the convenience store with him and Keenan were two ghetto chicks with nails and shit. Um, you know, Kel did okra instead of Oprah. He was okra. <laughs> and he did that for, se- you know, years and seasons. And so, uh, and also, yeah, Josh Server, who was the longest standing cast member, he definitely had a bunch of uh, female uh, roles as well. And, you know, it could be funny. It could be funny, I guess. But there's also females right there that could do the role and probably just be acting funny. It, the whole thing was it was a guy kind of dressed as a girl. Dan didn't think females was funny. Yeah, he was like, man, we can keep them in as, as few roles as possible. So you, you have children. Fuck, no, they ain't doing it. <laughs> if your kids wanted to pursue acting, mm-hmm. how would you handle that? Well, they, they would have to be extremely talented first. We ain't doing it just because they're cute and somebody want to recruit you and they, they think they can put you in something. That, that ain't it. They would definitely have to show some amazing, some incredible interest, be able to spit off lines like Amanda Bynes. Like, she was incredible. Like, she had an incredible mind, and I believe they're they're. There was a better path for her. So I personally don't think my kids are that, <laughs> just to be honest. <laughs> they have some other talents like math and, you know, maybe sports and shit like that. So they, I, I don't see them and I don't see myself putting them into that or definitely not forcing them into that. But if they had a, a great interest, I, I would definitely get them into the classes, cultivate their skills, and allow them to, 
you know, I would say closer to 15, 16, 17. If they, you know, continue, let's see, a, let's see a, an elongated interest, not just I want to be on TV and make some money. That's that shit can, you know, it, it, it was with the wind. But in, gener- in general, in general, I would never put that out there for them. And I've told them like, yeah, y'all ain't gonna be like pop. Sorry, unless you, you know, unless you really want to do it and you figure it out, it, it ain't gonna be through me. I'm never gonna force that on them. So. Or any really any any entertainment because it's it's that peak it's that peak that I talked about I would hate to have them feel like they peaked so early in life and to be fighting to get back to the money to the fame and to all those things that you could just wait on and just live your childhood and wait on those things for later on in life and get famous off your merit and your hard work versus just hey for me I just I feel like I was chosen just because I was a. a a badass kid that could cuss good, you know what I'm saying? Like, I I look I look like I had an attitude, and I look like I could be a token at times, and you know I could play those roles. Obviously, I wasn't cursing or all that, but a lot of times, like my main character Leroy and Fuzz, I was just a badass kid that was talking shit, and so I was typecasted in that, and that's what they wanted me to do year round, and uh, that wasn't actually me; it's just a character that I could play. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit deep, but l- long story short. They ain't, they, ain't, they ain't fucking with it. They ain't gonna fuck with it unless they go out there and, and make their own skits, write, produce it, film it, edit it. All right, son, we're gonna, we gonna make sure that this goes to the right place and that you're in control of your own destiny. But that audition and shit is for the birds. Mm. You're just basically begging for a job. That being said, I was thinking about putting my kid in that acting school you went to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the great. research, yeah, I went over to that thing and I was like, oh, it's like 600 bucks. I'll put my kid in this no, shit. No, but that's training, though. That's training. You know, they're not promising you nothing. And there's, there, there are some good things about acting that is, uh, you know, it definitely develops your brain, your memory, and, um, and there's a lot of positives to acting. It's just what the you fame about that school because they said it was like speech and a bunch of shit. It was like I would recommend Amazing Grace Conservatory to anyone. Like I'm biased because I was there for from seven to eighteen. So and it, I, I came up under Wendy Raquel Robinson, which is uh, Miss Piggy on um, Steve Harvey Show, also Tasha Mack from The Game. So she kind of taught me a lot about acting, also dancing, and everything about the entertainment industry. And also Denise Dow's Rest in Peace. She was on 90210. Uh, also, she played the the, um, the principal on Coach Carter. Mm. They, th- those are some of the people that started the uh, that school, and they're all about kids and cultivating them. It's never about forcing them into the industry or getting famous. So I, I would definitely recommend anyone to that wants to get training. Just get just stick to training, stick to training until you can make a decision as an adult to actually pursue this because it's not pretty and it's not really that lucrative unless you're in the top ten percent, right? Most actors are broke as hell. Actually, the top three percent probably, right? And that school's like a nonprofit. I saw, and it looks pretty cool. Where is it at? That is right off Washington, and around Crenshaw in Washington. Josh saw the documentary and he was like, "I cannot wait to put my kids into acting." <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I'll right. kill him. That's what you took away from all this. Because I'll kill a motherfucker immediately. I can't wait. <laughs> And he just want he just want an excuse to kill somebody and be like, yeah, I was insane, man. I saw a dick pic and I blasted his ass. I wasn't insane, but I watched that documentary and I wasn't gonna let him know. You looking, you looking for an excuse to take somebody out, huh? Oh my god, that's, that's right. it. I, I was I was wondering who was gonna get I'm to that joke <laughs> faster. I'm just trying to Mac- I'm just trying to Macaulay Culkin my kids and take yeah, over the money. Yeah, yeah. Man. I mean, if they have immense talent and there is just no denying it, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to suppress that. Fuck that! <laughs> you live in L.A. You're gonna be an actress, right? Fucking right. Kids, goddamn, start paying your fucking your way key. around here. Start paying your fucking way around. I'm gonna be like Shia LaBeouf's dad. I'm gonna. Beat those motherfuckers <laughs> till they get their acting skills right. Hey, but look, there should be more laws to protect. <laughs> Against just, me? The kids yeah. from the parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but really the network, you know what I'm saying? I believe there should be some more laws in place. And shout out to like Allison Stoner. She was the kid that was in a Missy's video that was dancing around. She's she's actually got some laws passed in some other states that really protect children in the industry. And really, um, you know, I, I have I have my hand in that as well. I hope to move forward and uh, really make some change for the next Is that generation. Why she ain't been no more videos. Who, Allison? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't 
don't think she had a problem with Missy. She had a problem with some other networks, not Missy. Though. She, yeah, yeah, I know. She but was like, Missy, but she was in everything set. for a minute. No, yeah, like she was on. I think she did some stuff. Is that with Nickelodeon, the little girl with Disney. the Sia shit too? Or who from was where? the who was the Sia girl? Who that little girl that was in like every fucking Sia video? Mm. And then like she I disappeared. I don't listen to Sia. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Now, what about the money part? We haven't even dove Ooh. into that. Like. W- was it worth it? And how often are you guys there? Are you guys there, you know, seven days a week, 10 hours a day? I mean, I don't know what the schedule is. And I don't know if you have to be there, even if you don't have a skip that's going to be ran that week. And then, you know, what was the pay scale? Yeah. So typically we were there five days, uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday, three weeks out of the month. So we got one week off for every three weeks we worked. And actually I went back to regular school during those weeks. Not ever, all the kids did it, but I would take that one week and go back to school. And, you know, I think my mom's really just trying to keep me grounded and everything like that. As far as the pay, man, Nickelodeon, uh, so I, I've, I call them Slickelodeon, you know. <laughs> I got I got a nickel and diamond shirt that I be that I rock from time to time. Um, Did you get a weekly check? What did it? Look it was like? like a per episode check, and oh wow! And uh, you know it was decent money, uh, but not in comparison to the industry standard. So I believe we were governed by AFTRA, and not SAG. And so they found a loophole there. And then right. you, and what you find with Nickelodeon is a lot of the kids get they start on Nickelodeon, so they don't have a, uh, an extensive work history, nothing really to compare it to. You're a novice, and you're what do you look like turning down a, a industry job, especially as a regular on a show? Like, right. we, I definitely tried to negotiate the pay. Uh, didn't go far, and we just accepted, right? <laughs> so I was like, what the fuck are we going to do? What um, was the pay? I don't know if you want to I would say, say it's less... It, I'll, be, I'll keep it real. It was like two k an episode, two thousand dollars. So if you had ten episodes that week, you, you, if you got ten episodes a season, that would be like twenty thousand for the whole for the whole season, right? And so where other shows, if, if you were on ABC, a CBS, a, a, you know, one of these major networks, is like twenty thousand an episode, even for the kids just starting off. So right. it was definitely about a tenth of the normal industry standard. And to some of the kids that I was right next to, like a Marcus Polk or, uh, you know, or Orlando Brown or so some of So whether or not kids, you did 10 shows within that episode, you only got $2,000. You would get $2,000 per, per show. So okay. whether I did five skits or one skit, I would get the same 2000 Damn. It, it went up a little bit, maybe to 3,000, like towards the end. I did three seasons. We had like a little pay scale that went up, you know what I'm saying? But it, so. Um, and then they were like, it's getting too high. Let's get them the fuck yeah, out of here. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, like I would say some of the other cast members, they tried to negotiate and even took some time off. They ended up settling and coming back. Maybe they got a little bit more. You know, I would say some of the other cast members definitely got more than me. I, I'm not going to be like, I was at the top. But it was definitely, like I said, about a 10th. Of the industry standard when you're comparing yourself to other people that I knew on other shows. And wow. then I had to pretend like I was just as popping as them or just as rich as them. Like, I couldn't take my mom. My mom, like I said, my mom was working every day. She never really relied on my, um, you know, my pay in any way. And then, you know, from that 2000, you know, you could break it down real quick. 30% is going to go to taxes. 30% went to the Coogan Law, so 30% was put away for me, right? Um, and so you're already at 60%. I had to pay an agent. A manager, that's another ten percent. Another ten percent. I paid my my um, my uh, on set my Geraldine, right? She was my on set nanny, or she was looking after me. So that was probably another. Nick Lodin doesn't cover the, nah, the t- no expenses, you know. So that was maybe another ten percent, and then I just bought some Jordans, and that was <laughs> <laughs> that was it. I, I stayed fly, you know. I had some Tommy Hilfiger. But it had some to food be food. dope going back to public school. Oh, he was yeah. famous as shit. Yeah, I was he's the, famous. He's the most popping dude on campus. Just met Ice Cube, you know what I'm saying? Had the new J's on. So that part was <laughs> that part was fly, but in reality, we didn't have the big house and shit. Like there was other kids though that didn't realize that they was way more popping than me. Right. You know what I'm saying? I just could I knew how to freak out. I knew how to do it from day one because I always just had the swag like that. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what got me on the show. So they looked at me that way, but in reality, I was struggling or just the same as any other kid that had a pair of Jordans. Right. You know, it was just a pair of J's, like Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I know you've been trying to call me all day, but girl, he just left. And I I had to wait till he left to call you because I know I said I was going to break up with him. But last night, he did like... 
a full 180. He was an animal. Where did this come from? Because you know, I've been telling you, it's been like kind of dull and like something changed. And I don't know what his secret is, but I'm trying to find out. Shh. His secret, Sword Vitality. All right, so, you know, the getting slime thing on Nickelodeon is like classic. Yeah, of it's all a staple. Time. Yeah. Like, celebrities used to, it's like, you know, they probably got pictures getting slimed hanging around their house until this shit came out. Now they're probably going <laughs> to shut, take that picture down. But, uh, you know, that shit's classic. And you were on a, like a spin off show, right? F figure it out. It was, yeah, figure it out. Figure it, it out. It's like a game a, show where it's all about getting slimed. Yeah. Everybody getting slimed over and over. Um, I mean, speaking of getting slimed and people taking their picture down, <laughs> Halle Berry, she got slimed at um, Halle the Berry Kids' was Choice Awards. She, no, no, no. She got slimed at the Kids' Choice Awards, though, yeah. which was oh, the okay. Nickelodeon's, uh, you know, their award show. And Drake put it up. She asked him, can you take that down? Because it did look kind of like mm. she got slimed. Yeah. <laughs> but um, she got slimed. She got slimed. Don't take it down, Drake. But um, no, on, on the show, on Figure It Out, it was definitely like a rite of passage, like to, to make it from a Nickelodeon show to Figure It Out. Because it was like all the best stars from Nickelodeon. If you got to get to Figure It Out, it was like, okay, you actually making some noise on the network. We want to see you somewhere else and test you out. Now, I only did three episodes, so I don't know if they was rocking with me. <laughs> they tested me out real, real quick. Um, but yeah, I got slimed on there. I think that was the only time I actually got slimed. We didn't do too much sliming on all that. It was always some other substances, like maybe some chocolate or something crazy. You know, they had Randy Mandy, and but um, we we definitely got messy on there. Were you there when we were doing the Fear Factor stunts? No, nah, the the, 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 uh, the on air dares. Yeah, <laughs> hell no, no, nah, no. They did a lot of sliming, yeah. and uh, my guy, my guy Brian Hearn got covered in chocolate, and they licked. Uh, they had a million dogs come out and licked all yeah, the chocolate. Peanut butter, off. yeah, that yeah. sounds terrible. And he was like, and he was on there saying, yeah, he yeah, was saying, he was I don't like, want to do so this. So uncomfortable, <laughs> like in the show, like please stop. It. <laughs> he was saying, I don't want to do this in the show, and they kept yeah. that in the damn show, and. You know, I think it's it's kind of fucked up because they're paid to be professional actors, and you got them doing Fear Factor shit. Like, you know, they I think they put scorpions in their mouths yeah. and it's weird shit. Like, I'm a professional actor. Like, that's a, that's just kind of weird. But um, yeah, getting slimed, I would say you you got to do it if you're on Nickelodeon and you did get slimed and you kind of feel like you missed out and it's vanilla pudding, so it's actually pretty yummy. Mm. Okay, vanilla <laughs> pudding. That's pause the, pause on that's, that, yeah, <laughs> that's the fucking secret. Vanilla pudding is the slime. I yeah. always wonder what it smelled like. Yeah, it's 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 good as hell. It wasn't and too just bad. Yeah, color it. They just it's just dyed green. And so it's fine to eat it. It's, it's fine. fine. It was kind of fire. That's why if you watch uh, Figure It Out, you know, uh, Danny Tamborelli was known for oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was taking it down. He was taking it to the head, to the mouth. Jesus, Danny. Take it easy. Some people was loving it. He was loving it. Jesus, Danny. They say it's good for your skin. Yeah, yeah. Take it easy, Alejandro. Okay, yeah. Different slime. I was like, for real? Oh, no. Don't worry about Alejandro. He's got some weird shit. Yeah, yeah, facial Weird shit going on with him over there. I'm figuring that out, too. <laughs> favorite skits, man. What was your favorite skits you were a part of? I or? mentioned uh, CJ and the Cloudy Nights. Um, you know, I loved the attention that I got one from Wyclef. And then I got to show my singing and dancing ability. You know what I'm saying? That was really one of the main intros that I had into the industry was just I also like to sing and dance on top of my comedic timing. And so I always say that was my favorite. Uh Leroy and Fuzz, um, you know, I did, a, I want to say about 15 different iterations of that. Um, and so it, it always felt good to have my own character, have my own staple, uh, something for people to really remember me by. So I always, you know, hold that in high regard as far as them and um, thankful to the writers. You know, they, 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 they might did some bad, but they did some good too, right? They wrote me in and, and allowed me to, uh, you know, really shine in that character. So I'm was always that the thankful one, for that. You had one with Kel, right? Where you were like, oh, little... that's a good one too. What was the. Uh, that Actually, that's a good one. I could also name that as a favorite. So that was repair. Repair man and repair boy, boy, yeah. boy, boy, boy. 
So I was another boy. <laughs> he wasn't in tights. So I had overalls. I was covered up in that oh, one. Okay. But um, you know, repair man would come in, and he was supposed to be repairing shit. He always fuck shit up. So. <laughs> and so they allowed me to come in. We like literally fucked up a Volkswagen Bug. Like somebody <laughs> had stopped on the side of the road as Lori Beth and uh, Danny Temporelli. And so they was like, "All right, we just need some gas." And we like we ended up fucking up the whole vehicle. <laughs> Took it all apart, <laughs> and so uh, you know stuff like that was is why I wanted to get on the show yeah. because you know being able to just destroy sets and you know just act silly and act wild and really improv and them catch it on tape is the magic that happened on all that. <clears throat> what was the first time? What was the first time you were on set and like kind of nervous maybe or because you said you was watching Keenan and Kale on the show before you even joined? What mm-hmm. was the first? Skit you were in with them, or were you nervous for your first skit with them? You know, or was it even like that? You were just like went in and killed it. I think, I think for me, you know, um, I was more nervous probably in like rehearsals and like table reads. Um, but when the audience was there and when the cameras was on, I think that's when I just I'm able. That's where I'm most natural. I'm able to let loose and really just hop into things. Um, and so I, I never really remember honestly being. Nervous, unless I was, unless Dan Snyder was looking over my shoulder. <laughs> no, because literally, like, um, you know, he was a big part. I believe he may have created Leroy and Fuzz, and his voiceover is actually in the beginning. Um, and so sometimes he would come down and watch, and Brian Robbins as well, too. And so when they were on set, he was the executive producer of the show. When they were on set watching me do my, my shit solo, I sometimes would get nervous because it was just like the big dog was there. And it's just me and it was a puppet. It was kind of like Sesame Street and we would like battle. And so there were times where I was like felt the pressure to perform. But in general, like especially if I wasn't like the main focus, I did a lot of, um, you know, supporting roles. That shit was a breeze, man. I love being in front of an audience. So that's where I felt most natural for sure. Nice, dope. So overall, you had a great time at Nickelodeon. Yeah, I mean, you kind of missed the miss what, what missed miss the what? documentary gap of the weird shit. Yeah, yeah. I would say you know, I would say I, I just noticed the politics. Yeah. I just noticed that I wasn't getting chosen. I'll be honest with you. I like, I was like, hey, Ken and Keller, man, they got the same management. They over there chummy with Dan and some of the executive producers. I. You know, I wish maybe I had a manager or a representative, uh, representative on set that was like pushing more towards uh, towards that. But maybe it was for the best, right? That I wasn't so involved and that I wasn't being chosen in that way. So you know, I could be thankful at the same time. But overall, you know, I had a I had a good time on set for sure. Um, you know, and it was one of the best shows of all time, especially kids shows. So I didn't notice a lot of the things that I went through until later on in life. And looking back, like I said, in 2020, I started seeing the viral Dan uh, footage and shit. I'm like, damn, this was crazy. I was part of this. <laughs> but I wasn't thinking about it in that way at the time. And so, you know, mostly I was very grateful, but also wanted to be an advocate for child stars. Just make sure they're on the right path moving forward. So... Keenan and Kale didn't go through none of this, or like you don't. It, it, there are no a- accusations only against the one guy so far, right? Is that all that's going on, or how many people were involved, or how many people did it go down to? Like, I, I believe there's some more stuff that that could be uncovered, and I believe that there are some cast members and um, you know child stars in general that don't want to be in the bad graces of Nickelodeon, Paramount, Viacom, and all those you know the big, big companies. Kale, the big man, because Kale seemed like he liked the Nickelodeon Chris Tucker. Right. Where he was just like fire and then just like lost it or like something happened. And what did like you want to hear the switch or like what the fuck happened to kill? Cause he was fire. I would want to hear what he happened, was... how he, how he felt about it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Um, whether he chose to go away or whether he, they had an opportunity that, that he didn't want to move forward with, or maybe Keenan didn't want to move forward with and They had a split. Like the story hasn't been fully told. Uh, told. I think they have like kind of hinted at what, Things that have happened. Um, but, you know, I just hope that more people would come out. Uh, and it's not like to be a tell-all. It's just like as a cautionary tale for people coming up in the industry. Hey, this is what to look out for. This is how you navigate. Do the best for yourself and for your family. And, um, you know, I just want to hear more of those stories. And, um, you know, in general, I want to take it off 
just Nickelodeon because you hear some of the same stuff about Disney and like I, I'm not I'm never gonna boycott I'm not a boycotter you know what I'm saying so I could tell the truth and just speak you know just speak you know, from, from the heart, but like, I'll be boycotting Apple for what they be mining these like batteries, right? Disney with their grooming shit, Nickelodeon with what they got going on with the pedophiles, uh, Nike and their sweatshop. Like I'll be doing this shit all day. I rock all that shit and participating in culture. And like, I can navigate, you know, these type of moral issues for myself. So I don't need anyone to tell me what I should and shouldn't be doing or like have to follow a trend of boycotting anything. I, I believe there are bad actors in all companies. I believe you could listen to make music slap again, my album and be like, you know, boycott this dude or this dude should be canceled. So I don't think that that's always like the, the end uh, that, you know, the end all is just like canceling or saying that this doesn't belong on TV. I think, um, you know, Everything has its good and bad side, and it's up to us to really navigate that. How do you see the industry now as a post Weinstein? Well, you know, after all that news broke, mm -hmm. you because I feel like the film industry, the entertainment industry is similar, like you know, like the police, like there's a blue wall where you know things usually they they stay silent. Do you think it's gonna go back to that where you know power corrupts? Or the right, the right regulations are being taken care of so that doesn't happen again? I believe everything happens in waves. So I think right now we're in this wave where everyone's exposing. And, uh, like, we just seen what happened with Taraji. And she and she came out and talked up against Oprah. And then what, what she noticed is that she basically canceled her own movie. You know what I'm saying? Oprah do? <laughs> well, she said that. Well, it's basically saying that they're not paying. Yeah, they Terrence were Howard paid. also with Hustle and Flow said that he didn't get paid a lot for that movie. He got twelve thousand dollars allegedly. But see, and then, but then, are you asking people not to go see your work? You know what I'm saying? So it's like there, there's it's going to be in ways where people are going to be producing their own stuff, and hopefully they get the uh, the checks that they would like or, or see the outcome that they would like. But then on the on the other side, these networks are going to possibly be suppressing these independent arts, right? Because they want to keep their foot in the game. They want to get the they want to control the big checks, and so you're going to see these talents go right back to where they're quote unquote boycotting. So I believe it will happen in you know in waves where people will go independent but then realize they need a machine and um i, I don't think there's no right answer or, or there's no definitive way that it, it will be but um the good thing is there is the option now there is the option that you can do your own thing you don't have to be a part of the industry you can create an industry and uh and, and do things on your own terms i believe that's the way to go but at the same time that costs a lot of money there's a lot of determination it's a lot of work that goes into it and everybody's not built for that some everybody's not a businessman some people are just artists and even creating for yourself because i i work independent sets and sometimes you know they pay you in cash they don't pay you the the wage so it's like okay you're doing it by yourself but then you're exploiting other people right Right, right. And there is there is some good to the industry standards, right? We've seen that when it when it works correctly um, and when things are governed the way they should be. And I think to me, that's the future. What I want to focus on is how do we create a, a good standard for everyone, uh, specifically for child stars that works, that's uh, also profitable for them. And for, for me, it's like if because you asked earlier if it was worth it, like everything that I did, was it worth the money? Right. I don't think you can really make that decision until you are of age and you are really paying these bills and really figuring out life and you have to deal with your past self out there. Like I can't go work. I could, I, I, I have enough humility, but there's a lot of actors. I can't go work at McDonald's. I can't go work a customer facing job because people are, and it was it worth it for you to get that $20,000 in the nineties to never be able to work these certain yeah. jobs or or feel like you have to, uh, you know, mask your identity because of, you know, a check that you took 20 years ago that ain't worth shit now, just just off of inflation alone. But then, you know what I'm saying? True. But just from it being so long and not being, you know, being reoccurring in the industry, I believe they should have to, I believe networks should have to renegotiate with child stars once they become of age and be like, look, we want to continue to show your work. 
how much, you know, this is how much we, we are willing to pay you and let's negotiate it or just throw that shit away. That should be the risk that you are taking by putting child children in your work is that you may have to throw this shit away if they're not comfortable with this shit once they're of age. That's what I personally think. It may not be feasible and I'm sure no networks would like to hear something <laughs> like that because, uh, you know, it's a lot of money that they would have to throw away that's, you know, improperly invested, but there's got to be some change because you can't make that you can't determine is it worth it at seven because my right. mom said that it was worth it but it was worth it for her but is it going to be worth it for me who knows did yeah. you uh for the repeats or do they do repeats in Nick, nickelodeon oh, do residuals. They? Yeah, we yeah, residuals. residuals. did you guys get any of that or was it it wasn't written into the contract then? nickelodeon i think they exclusively like prohibited all residuals <laughs> Damn. This is crazy, you know? Hey, well, we should have talked about this first. Make sure this goes in the episode. This is the craziest part about Nickelodeon and why a, a big reason why I got into the child star advocacy is it wasn't it wasn't no pedophile shit that I was worried about. For me it was like it was like, yeah, people still ask me to do acting and recognize me and be like, oh, how come you not? Are you rich still? And it's like, duh, I haven't even got paid off this shit. <laughs> they, they've been watching it on like Paramount and it was even on Netflix for a little bit. Um, you know, I recently started getting like $50 checks. And I think that's because the streaming part was not uh, excluded because streaming wasn't out then. So I believe they, there may be something that they have to pay out. But for years... What what I've been what I was told and what I heard is that they there's some laws like if it goes you know the longer you are away from the beginning of the show the lower the residuals get and if right. it gets past a certain time they they may be free and clear and allowed to just you know play the episodes mm -hmm. streaming they may not have been able to get around but uh, I believe Nickelodeon has been playing a game where look we're just not gonna put it out until ten fifteen years and then it ain't worth shit like what are you gonna fight for five cents you know like. 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. I ain't fighting for that shit, man. I'd rather fight for the next generation. I don't need no money from them. I just would rather put out that that's some scammy shit. I wouldn't write no contract for a kid for that like that. You guys are industry professionals. You guys are in a position of power. W what is the purpose? What is the purpose? Just to undercut some kids? God, that's 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 a tough, you know, that's greed, a tough cookie man. to swallow. It's greed. Greed. It's great, and so, it's taking advantage. Speaking of the industry, and you say you do or you don't want to be a part of it. What do you got coming up? What do you got going on? What are you working on? What do you? Uh, I heard you didn't you direct a direct a video Corey for Feldman. Corey Feldman? <laughs> Shout out to my guy Corey. <laughs> Shout out Corey. I'm Another trying to, reach out to get Corey on here for sure. Oh, Wait, talk about Corey. Your experience with Corey. I don't know. Oh, Corey. Yeah, there you go. I took a whole different. Perspective on Corey Feldman one day when I saw him in Ralph's in Woodland Hills and oh. he had just like two girls with him. Player, just player. Floating yeah. through Ralph's. <laughs> like, I was like, I was like, Corey fucking Feldman? I was like, what is going on in here? He I was like, I didn't know like you were pimp. fucking yeah. out here just doing God's work still. Yeah. <laughs> you ain't heard of Corey's Angels, bro? He got the whole Angels. Corey's Angels? Yeah, I never yeah, heard of Corey's Angels. That, yeah, yeah. Holy shit. New respect for fucking Corey. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell is Corey's Angels? Uh, he had a little, a little harem, you know what I'm saying? I think he ended up marrying one of them. Damn. They're, I think they've uh, Is he been still divorced. with two? Or he only got one? I'm not sure what he has going on right now in his personal. I know he recently got divorced, which is, uh, I, I think it may be sad. I'm not sure. I don't know how he's <laughs> feeling about it. He might have just called the angels. I don't know. I don't know if he called the angels back and got You know, he's started. not sad. He's Corey yeah, Feldman. He's a goddamn know, legend. Shout out to Courtney. <laughs> Courtney was cool, too. So she was actually in the video. So I did direct a video with um, called Without You between Corey and his, at that time, his wife, Courtney. And uh, it was like a whole love story of how they met. And then by the time it came out, they was like broke up. But <laughs> uh, Corey plays against much bigger crowds than I thought. Yeah. You know, like, he's playing music and yeah, producing he's music. He's and like he's tour touring thing. with Limp Biscuit. Is he with Limp right? Biscuit? I think he's yeah. touring with Limp Biscuit is what, is what Bro and said. He got some decent music. He got some cool music. Uh, like, uh, he, he's, he's, a, he's definitely a rock star. I'll say go see his show if you, are, if, you're, if you like nostalgia, 80s, 90s, and you know anything about Corey Feldman, I would definitely recommend this show. He puts on about a two-hour show and his star studded. Like, you know, he come out jewels, yeah. beaded, glass, uh, he's jackets and shit. Michael yeah, Jackson moves and shit. shit. He he always always out there. Scary. He is a little scary. <laughs> now, if you're not into that shit, yeah. I would say don't go. But if you're into it, definitely go. It's definitely 
definitely worth it. Yeah, yeah. Corey, we try to get Corey on here for sure. That'd be dope. But yeah, but as far he's as one of the kids that like that's just like. He's the originator of fucked up kids in Hollywood. Yeah, like, I mean, he had a whole grooming situation. He was a whistleblower, and, yeah. uh, you know, I've been able to thank him for what he's done for Child Star, so that was definitely a, a full circle moment. Is uh, he in, like, helping, kind of trying to do a thing, or he's just, like, trying to disconnect from the whole acting and just do music? Or I think it's... I, I, couldn't, I couldn't speak for him, but I would say that, you know, it's probably difficult for him because... He has mainstream talent, and he should still be in movies and stuff like that. And it's 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 difficult to navigate that, like whether you want to be in the industry or not. And you know, he still has a lot of connections. People still love him, and so he'll find his way. He'll find his niche. I believe he'll be back on, in, you know, in the good graces of the. I, I don't know if it's going to be Hollywood, but of the fans and be you able think to put out have his like a one day, yeah. like a fucking what's his name who resurrected himself Iron Man. Oh, uh, Robert Downey. Did he have a Robert Downey Jr. come back? I think so. I think Something he has like it in. that. I think he has comes it in. Comes back him, real strong. Somebody gives him a tight ass who was role. On, was that, who was on Two and a Half Men? Was uh, Charlie, Charlie Sheen. Cryer or Charlie Sheen? Charlie, Charlie, Sheen. Charlie Sheen. So sim- Oh yeah. I think he something could, like that. I think TV he could do show either like one that, of those. Like yeah, I think he could be a Sheen be dope or Robert like Downey. I would love to see that for him. He's a great dude in person. And yeah, what about you, man? Down. You coming back? What's up? 80s, 90s, and 2000 vibes, the podcast, also the network. Actually, we were number 50 on Entertainment Podcast this past week. So we, uh, we're moving on up. And uh, Damn, we had to take you out. Yeah, it's cool. You know, we can have a little competition, man. So, uh, <laughs> but nah. So uh, I'm, I'm definitely podcasting right now, um, and you know that's. I like to be myself versus trying to get back into acting or, you know, putting on these costumes. You know, I, I may look uh, take up uh, voiceover work. Maybe we'll see like anything that doesn't isn't too forceful on my home life or, you know, or on the things I don't want to be in, in the front of the camera too much. I, I'm Are your right kids ever like, what's up, dad? Why are you still acting? They ever give you no you know, shit? No, we put on shows at the house. Oh, like okay. I still got a little fuzz puppet. So I do <laughs> I do the grown up version of Leroy and Fuzz where I talk of politics. I'll talk Biden and Trump and all this shit. And so, um, <laughs> oh, you know, online for your, yeah, yeah. Okay, check okay, out, okay, you guys yeah, check yeah, out yeah. Leroy and Fuzz. I got about like 50 episodes that I put out. So I'm still dibbling, dabbling. I do my own stuff, um, you know, skit stuff. But yeah, podcast. Podcasting is where I'm at, and then I'm also putting on a a Nickelodeon celebration called SplatCon, right? So we're going to be celebrating the the happier times yeah. of Nickelodeon, and really it's something for the guests, um, the celebrity guests, to, to get out there and be able to monetize themselves and, and meet up with their fan bases, because Nickelodeon ain't calling us back, really, so... How's that going with the new doc that's going to drop? We'll see, man. Little. We'll see. It's a, It could be a clash, <laughs> but like I said, you know, I'm not here to boycott Nickelodeon yeah. or anything. We're just talking about the bad actors, the people that were bad there, and I believe there's bad people at every company, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so... so we're, we're going to have a bunch of guests out. It's going to be at the Hilton LAX on October 19th and 20th, right here in LA. You guys are welcome to come on. You guys want to uh, uh, yeah. interview some people, some Nickelodeon stars. We're going to actually have a podcast room probably, so we'll have a whole setup. Let's go. We out to, there. Can uh, I fucking shit. slime somebody? Are you hey. going to have slime? Hey, we, are you going to have slime? Have some slime. It might be CGI. No, I'm playing. No, uh, as long as we ain't getting, as long as you, you know, sign uh, uh, some, some forms, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, still the you weren't forced yard. to be, you weren't forced to be slime. Yeah, yeah, exactly. slime you, I don't, don't put my kid under that shit. Under there. <laughs> no kids, yeah, no, no forced <laughs> kids to be slime. Oh yeah, splat con. But no, uh, you know, it's gonna be a great time. We still celebrate the good stuff, and we definitely do not want to boycott the 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 actors and the artists, and even the writers and producers that had nothing to do with this shit. Not right. everybody was bad just because one dude. Most of these people was just trying to keep Three their damn dudes, job, but. and so please don't. <laughs> Don't don't just like don't cancel the whole show. Don't cancel all oh, Nickelodeon. Some people are still making their money off this shit, and they're not bad people. So let's just cancel the people that deserve to be canceled and just leave it like that. And to find out who it is, go check out Quiet on Set HBO. That's right. Quiet on Set HBO check it Max. out coming out, out tonight. Now. No, it's out now. Out By the right time they see it, it's out. out. By the right time out now. Out. That's right. Yes, sir. Alejandro, edit fast. Okay. All right. All right, man. Appreciate you coming in. Another episode down. Thanks for tuning in. That's fucked up. Damn. I 
am about to rock your world. Babe, you know you can't handle all of this without your sword. I swear this never happens. I guess I'll just text Lance a lot. He never has this problem. No, I am King Arthur. I was worthy of Excalibur, and I'm worthy of sword vitality! Now that is a sword fit for a king. But do you know how to use it? Become a better man with sword vitality.